good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we would like you to welcome uh, you today to the webinar The Future Role of LNG in the European Union, organized by the Council of European Regulators, SEER. Um, thank you warmly for your participation. Uh, there are more than 450 people joining us today, so this means that there is a great interest in this subject, LID in Europe. Um, of course, uh, we would like to thank also the high-level speakers uh, who are with us today. Uh, I'm Garcia Brito, co-chair with uh, my colleague Yves uh, Ponselet of the LND Work Stream of SEER. I'm the gas director of the Spanish Regulator. And I have been working in the gas sector for 25 years, uh, many of them in regulation. So I have witnessed how liberalization and competition has developed around Europe and how LNG evolution has contributed to it. I leave you with the introduction of my colleague, Yves, please. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yves Ponsley. I'm the co-chair of the CR LNG Workstream, uh, together with Rocio, as she said. Um, I also have more than 25 years experience in the gas sector, uh, starting with pipeline gas in my previous uh, position, um, as well as gas purchase and gas uh, sales. Um, a little bit more than 10 years ago, I uh, joined the regulator, where I'm now in charge of uh, the regulation of LNG aspects. Um, so times are challenging. LNG is a booming business. Um, it's uh, it is why we've organized that seminar, that webinar. Sorry, um, and um, I give the word back to Rocio for some explanation on how the, the day with or oh, the how the day will uh, be organized. Thank you, If uh, We are just in the platform go to webinar of SEER as tool for this virtual workshop. So before starting, some technical indications on the tool. So the webinar is organized with a keynote speech and two panels. After the keynote speech, um, each panel, there will be a question and answer uh, session. Uh, for that, uh, the audience can submit written questions using the question and answer toolbox, the chat. And the moderator will choose the questions and put them to the panel once they have finished the presentation. During each presentation, only the moderator and the panelists will have the video camera on. Uh, the panelists or the organizers will control the slides. Um, for the panelists to take control of the presentation, they might click once uh, to take the control and then uh, click again and wait two or three seconds for the next slide to appear. Uh, after each panel, uh, the moderator and all the speakers of the panel, we have the, the video camera and the microphone switched on in order to participate in the debate and answer the questions. Well, let's start. Uh, I think we have chosen a particular tricky moment for this LNG webinar. Initially, we would have planned it for, well, <laughs> spring but we were waiting for better conditions in order to see if we were able to make it presential nevertheless uh, i think this is a good tool so here we are um, the tricky times uh, for lng hasn't been so bad because we have been uh, looking into the lng trade grow a lot during uh, last year and the beginning of the three big first month of this year and even with the global impact of the COVID-19 on demand and economic growth, LND has been able to, to, to maintain in, in Europe. With weaker demand and all the supply conditions, uh, our supply condition has strengthened for, for gas and for LND particularly, so causing prices uh, for European markets to plummet. So in this context, we are going to, to develop our webinar today and hear our speakers. If please. Yes, so the main subject that we'll be discussing today are um, starting with the global perspectives and the future trends in energy markets, uh, starting with a keynote by Professor Jonathan Stern. 
Of course, as CER, we couldn't miss the regulation of LNG in Europe, and that would be the topic of the first panel of the webinar. And um, the second panel uh, will deal with the role of LNG in order to achieve a decarbonized economy. Um, the first and second panel will be moderated by uh, the regulators. On the one hand, Mr. Agustin Alonso, who works with the Spanish regulator, and Mr. Benoit Esteno, who works for uh, the French regulator. And I would like to extend our warmest thanks to them as well. And to begin with the interventions, as I've said, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Jonathan Stern, who will be giving us a keynote speech about the World Energy Outlook for the coming years. Professor Stern is a distinguished research fellow and founder of the Natural Gas Research Program at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. He holds professorships at the University of Dundee and Imperial College in London, as well as fellowships in the Energy Delta Institute and the Institute of Energy Economics in Tokyo, Japan. He's the author and editor of several books, including Natural Gas in Asia, The Pricing of Internationally Traded Gas, and The Future of Gas in the Gulf. He's author of two chapters in the um, Oxford Institute for Energy Studies book, LNG Markets in Transition, The Great Reconfiguration. His most recent publications are Narratives for Gas in Decarbonizing European Energy Markets and Challenges to the Future of LNG Decarbonization affordability and profitability. His current paper, Accurate Measurement of Methane Emissions from Natural Gas and LNG in Power Supply Chains, an increasingly urgent issue for the future of gas in Europe, will be published later this year. So, Professor Stern, you have the floor. Eve, thank you very much, and, and thank you to Sarah for inviting me to do this. Um, uh, as, as has been said already, um, I come from uh, the Natural Gas Research Programme. We are an academic group working on uh, the commercial but also other aspects of natural gas in a broad geographical and industrial context. Um, we have a whole group of sponsors, some of whom are on these panels, which is very good to see, and we spend a great deal of time discussing, debating and, and networking. Um, if you're interested in our work, uh, you simply go to our site. All of our work is free to download as we are a, a, an educational charity. So what I'm going to do over the next 20, 25 minutes or so is to take you through um, some of the work that we have been doing um, over the past year um, as the outlook has been changing, some of it based on modeling, some of it based on our observations. So let's look at that, what seems like a very far off time before COVID-19. Um, what were we expecting before COVID-19, certainly in, in, in our group? Well, we were expecting uh, grow, uh, global gas consumption to rise by 1.5%. Um, we were expecting uh, European consumption maybe to rise marginally. We, we thought that LNG export capacity would increase significantly, just generally matched by the growth in, in LNG imports. Um, it's, it's now easy to forget that prices had already dropped significantly even before COVID started. And we thought they would be about a dollar lower than in, in 2020 than in 2019. In other words, around $4 um, less in, in Europe and maybe middle in, in, in Pacific. So we already had this increase in the supply overhang and, and stranded gas. Um, so I'm I'm having a problem moving the slides forward. Uh, let me try one more time. Maybe the organisers can help me by moving the slide forward. Thank you very much. So in in 2020 and the next few years, what are we expecting to happen? Well. Global gas demand, we think, will decline about 3.5% this year, but LNG imports will be similar to last year, but of course, significantly less than we expected. Um, in terms of the next five years overall, um, we in the Institute are slightly more optimistic than the IEA. IEA is looking at global gas growth of 1.5%. We are looking at more like 2.5% over the next five years. But that is going to depend on a whole lot of issues that you see um, in the bullets below, which I'm not going to read out because I'm going to 
deal with some of them as I go through this presentation. I think though the most important thing to remember here is that as we look forward, almost as far as you want to look, LNG is going to account for the vast majority of the increase in global gas trade. Um, with the exception of some pipelines from Russia to Europe and Russia to Asia, there are very few large international gas pipelines which we think are going to go ahead over really as far as we can see into the future. So um, basically, uh, if we can have the next slide, please. Uh, that The next section is our outlook to 2025. Just recalling that, of course, um, I'm going to talk, I know this, this seminar is mainly about LNG in Europe, but it's really not possible to talk about LNG in Europe without looking at, to some extent, general gas development, including pipelines, and also, of course, LNG globally. So this is the way we see the next five years. Um, a drop uh, in this year, um, and then a recovery in 2021 of global gas demand. Um, and the, the key thing here is that we see a significant decline of in Europe, in North America, and in Russia this year. Um, across the board rebound next year, Europe a bit less than others. Uh, basically, Asia and the Middle East lead the growth uh, in really 2021 to 25. And by the time we get to 2025, we are almost on our projections back to what we thought would happen back in 2019. So this is a period of general recovery in the gas market from the pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, key thing in 2020 in Europe is that all sources were squeezed, but pipeline exports, so pipeline imports, especially squeezed. Um, and in 2021, pipeline imports benefit most from the rebound in demand. Um, LNG imports plateau to 2025, but, and this is the key thing about how certainly our calculations work, they will depend very significantly about what happens with storage. Um, what you see on this, on this chart is that 2019 and 2020 are the high points of LNG imports up to 2025. But you need to understand this context. Our model looks at what we think will actually be demanded in terms of LNG. If you go to the next slide for me, um, what it does not do is to project what will happen during the winter. So what we could see, if we have a series of colder winters and storage empties, we could see a significantly higher volume of LNG imported than I showed you in the previous slide. Now, if we, if we look at 2019, we see almost 20 BCM of gas, of, of LNG imported into Europe to be put into storage because of anticipation of it being needed in the next gas year. So this is, this is a little bit complicated in terms of what we are expecting for European LNG in the next five years. In general, we see flat or slightly declining, but we could be, we could be very surprised about that if we have a series of colder winters where storage empties considerably during the winter period. And this is really because we see LNG as the marginal molecule in Europe. Um, and we see pipeline gas as really the baseload molecule. So following that thought, if you could go to the next slide, um, this means that uh, global capacity utilization of LNG has fallen sharply and it will fall again in 2021 if Europe doesn't absorb that excess supply. As you see, as, the, as, as we go forward to 2025, the market starts to tighten uh, and the next surge of supply, uh, which is probably around 2024, 25, then starts to reduce utilization again. Um, but a lot of this will depend on how we see uh, the outlook going forward for the expansion of imports and exports, which is on the next slide, please. 
So on, on this slide, what you see is an ex a significant expansion of LNG because of the projects that are already committed. We see them some of those being delayed due to COVID, perhaps due to some investment issues, um, but basically anything that has been committed we think will come on. North America and Gata uh, dominating supply growth. The quite big difference in outlooks, ours and many others that I'm sure many of you have seen, is in Asia. We think that China, everyone sees China driving demand. We are very enthusiastic about Southeast Asia. For those of you who are interested, we a paper put on our site in the last week or two, which looks at these so-called smaller markets, when, when, which when you add them all together, actually form a very big number. The really difficult one for us is India. Um, there are there are outlooks that are highly enthusiastic about Indian LNG um, import expansion. We are, shall we say, less enthusiastic, uh, more sober about Indian LNG imports for reasons that I'll come to uh, when I get towards the end. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Of course, everybody knows everybody knows this chart. Um, the, the very high prices of the of the early 2010s uh, gradually converging as we get towards the end of the decade. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, of course, uh, gas prices falling way way before oil prices. So this has led to some significant changes, I think, in the way that we see LNG trade moving ahead. As you know, the, the great portfolio traders who made a lot of money moving LNG from higher price to lower price markets, excuse me, the other way around, from lower price to higher price markets. Um, of course, this is much less profitable um, when the, the differentials are relatively small. But the key thing that we believe is we don't see that that kind of difference will re-emerge rapidly until 2023-24. Yes, there will be some differences in the prices in Asia and Europe, but essentially with the COVID-19 impact still ongoing, we see uh, subdued prices and subdued differentials, which I will carry on into the next slide, please. So this is the way that the forward curve and, and our model projects prices going forward to 2025. And I think the learning for me uh, is how long prices can remain below short run marginal cost, uh, perhaps reflecting how long they were above long run marginal cost earlier in the 2010s. Um, and, and that really affects any kind of short term evaluation of what, what, how, how prices are going to move. Um, basically, prices rise in 2021 if LNG is shut in in some jurisdictions like the US where it proves not to be profitable to, to deliver. Um, but if not, and storage fills faster, then prices will be much lower. So um, I am, I personally am nervous about the significant rise in the forward curve in the last month or two. So what you see here, as I mentioned before, is uh, as the tightening, uh, as the market tightens, Prices increased through 2024, but then the next LNG supply surge that we saw on a previous slide, which comes on around 2024, 25, then starts to bring downward pressure again. But before I leave this slide and as sort of as, as, a, as a foretaste of what I'm going to say in a few minutes, um, if we see Pacific LNG prices, whether JCC or JKM, above $6 a million BTU on a sustained basis, that is going to threaten the demand expansion that I mentioned in several uh, Asian countries. So that I think is going to be something we all need to watch, that the demand, uh, certainly the global demand, is certainly not guaranteed. It's dependent on what happens to price levels. So let's move forward to the next slide which is uh, the outlook beyond 2025. And can you move to the next one, please? So here you see how our model uh, basically sets out the world 
moving on to 2050. Um, in Europe, pipeline imports increase gradually until the early 2030s. You see that short-term dip in 2025-26. Uh, basically, all, almost all of the increases is from Russia via Nord Stream and Turk Stream. So to, to sound a controversial note, we do believe that Nord Stream 2 will eventually be completed, although we don't know when. Um, we'll see some growth from Azerbaijan. Um, the LNG import growth you see again from 2025 up to the early 2030s. So it moves back up to where it was in around 2019, 2020, largely driven by North America and Russia. And then you see LNG declining significantly um, whilst pipeline imports are maintained. And this is a little bit about how gas demand in Europe is going to develop post 2030. So that is, if you like, the overall picture in Europe. Um, could you move to the next slide, please? So the, LNG, the, the overall picture in Asia is a little bit complicated because of all of these different countries. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the growth continues to be driven by China, but ASEAN, the, 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 the so-called smaller Southeast Asian countries, but when you add those countries together, you get a number which in our model actually begins to equal the increase in LNG imports of China and India added together. Uh, and that's possibly because, as I said before, we are a little bit more conservative about Indian LNG imports than some other outlooks. But nevertheless, um, Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan and Bangladesh all grow steadily. Um, the, the traditional Japan, Korea, Taiwan markets probably relatively flat. Um, declines in Japan um, may be offset by some growth in Korea and, and Chinese Taipei. But that is very contingent on how you see Japanese nuclear power evolving. If it evolves as uh, the Japanese government wants and, and many utilities want, then maybe this is the right way to look at LNG in Japan. If, however, the nuclear industry continues to encounter problems of reopening reactors uh, and maybe some of the, uh, the new legislation and regulation that's being brought in, then we could see a different outcome in Japan. And of course, Japan uh, is still the largest LNG importer. Um, so that could be very, very significant. So uh, as I said before, the growth is matched, the growth in China and India through 2040 is matched by other Asian countries. Post 2040, the growth is essentially all in China. Um, there's not much growth elsewhere. Uh, and that is a factor of how we see other forms of energy developing in Asia uh, in the late 2030s and post 2040. So let me, this is the outlook that I've given you. Now let me finish with two sets of issues that our model does not resolve. And this is the problem that we have between uh, the modelers in our group and those of us who, who study, as it were, what's happening on the ground and what governments are saying in our group. So next slide, please. Now, I know that this is gonna be a discussion, uh, subject for discussion in uh, one of the next panels, uh, but the problem that we have within our group is that this outlook is not consistent with decarbonisation targets, not even COP21 targets, never mind net zero targets in Europe. Um, the situation in Asia is maybe less problematic because targets are less stringent. And to be completely frank, uh, decarbonisation is not so close to the top of the agenda in many of these countries. So um, I know that the next session is going to consider uh, regulation in detail, but the overall question that we're asking ourselves and writing on is how far is the liberalized gas model that we've developed over the last 30 or so years, how far is this appropriate for the new uh, net zero decarbonization push in Europe? And in this respect, there are really a number of 
well, three groups of issues to be considered. Um, we need much more accurate measurement, reporting and verification of emissions from supply chain imports. Um, in other words, um, methane and, uh, and CO2 or general greenhouse gas standards combined with essentially higher taxes of various types that have been proposed. And whether forest offsets that we've seen, whether these are appropriate, and if so, how the methodology of those should work, and who should regulate that methodology. In other words, we, we're still not in a situation where when these are announced, we have any sense of, well, how was the uh, greenhouse gas uh, footprint of the imported LNG cargoes calculated? How were the forest offsets calculated? Um, this is a big area that I think is going to be very, very important. And I'm not talking about 2030 to 2040. I'm talking about in the next few years, particularly following the publication of the EU methane strategy, which we understand is now going to be either next month or at the latest in November. Secondly, in decarbonisation of gas, um, at really, or LNG, with carbon capture utilisation of storage, suggests a multi-purposing of regasification terminals. And I know that this is under study, I think by the GIE, but essentially, um, are regasification terminals just going to continue to import um, LNG, unabated LNG, or can, could these be expanded, extended, modified to import hydrogen, or ammonia, or if they're going to continue to import unabated LNG, um, does this mean that they we will see um, reforming, either steam reforming or auto reforming, uh, added to the terminals that exist currently? And for how long is unabated LNG going to be acceptable, um, given the targets that governments have put in place? Not just LNG, but do we need a new regulatory regime for repurposing pipelines, that is, a blending with hydrogen or new hydrogen and new hydrogen pipelines and storage storages? So, for me, these are big questions, and we are just starting to really address them. But if you look at the chart, and I'm sure many of you've seen the kind of classic chart from Clean Planet for, Planet for All, where only the last two columns on the right represent uh, the amount of gases, including unabated natural gas, which will be, um, as, the, as the EU model estimates, compatible with net zero, then what you see is there's only 60 to 80 BCM of unabated natural gas in Europe, which will be um, compatible with a net zero um, achievement by 2050. And in general, there are probably only about 250 to 300 BCM of gases in general, which will be compatible with that achievement. And of course, that is very, very significantly less than we've seen uh, in, well, certainly today, but, but historically. So this is a big problem um, and an unresolved issue. Um, we, we, we have our, our outlook, many other people have their outlooks, but is this compatible with the targets that governments um, and the EU uh, either have signed up to or look certain to sign up to very shortly. Let's move to the next slide. The other unresolved issue which I've kind of been pointing to as I've gone through the, the outlook is that the prices that we see don't look likely to remunerate new LNG projects. So the chart at the bottom is from the IGU's Wholesale Gas Price Survey of this year. And uh, there's a lot of detail that we could go into here. There are some problems with how, how this chart represents inflation, how it represents um, foreign exchange. But in a broad brush sense, what you see here is that there are only a couple of regions, Europe and Asia, where prices above $6 a million BTU have been maintained on a consistent basis over the last 15 years. Now, 
in some ways one can say, well, that's all right because a lot of the LNG will be delivered to Asia and, and Europe. Um, but there's a lot of detail here whereby many of the countries, particularly in Asia, have never paid even, even close to $6 a million BTU. And with most greenfield projects having delivered costs of more like $8 or higher, um, that is going to be a problem in terms of profitability. Um, my contention is that prices above $6 a million BTU will hold back demand in developing Asia. So much of the demand that I showed you in the previous charts simply is not going to happen because those countries are either not going to be able to afford to pay or they will find cheaper, mainly renewable projects um, which will uh, displace what would have been imported LNG. So what we'll see then if I'm right about the lack of profitability is that after this wave, we'll see a much slower investment in new projects, which will mean that as we get into the 2030s, we'll see a supply demand tightening uh, and possibly earlier than that in mid decade. And of course, then it becomes a kind of vicious circle because higher prices constrain demand just in the uh, countries and regions that you were hoping demand uh, would emerge on a much larger scale. So decarbonisation and profitability and affordability are issues that uh, certainly we have not resolved. Um, we are trying to devise a model for gas and LNG, which actually uh, takes into account the targets that have been adopted by governments. But it's uh, obviously very hard because you have to you have to decide um, how quickly certain certain um, uh, fuels like coal are going to be phased out, um, and how quickly some technologies, particularly low carbon and zero carbon technologies, are going to be phased in, and what the costs of those are going to be. So that's sort of our challenge, but I think it's a it's a challenge for everybody as we look forward. And uh, uh, if you move to my final slide, all that remains for me to do is to thank you very much, and I look forward to trying to answer some questions if you have them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stern. I think we might have some questions. If um, yes, uh, yes, I have uh, one question myself to start the discussion or the debate. Um, Mr. Stern, you said that the prices are not likely to remunerate new LNG projects. Um, previously in your presentation, you also said that um, LNG terminals might need to kind of reinvent themselves to import new types of gas. Um, are the new LNG projects as such really needed, I mean, at least in Europe? Okay. Well, um, this, is, this is a very interesting question about how you see what the needs are. So if you if you to look simply at European gas demand, and you to say, well, um, have we got enough regasification capacity? Have we got enough pipeline capacity? I think you would conclude that no more LNG import terminals are needed. However, what you see in some countries is that they are looking to build new LNG import terminals, not because they can't get gas, but because they can't get gas from the sources they want. So, for example, you have a country like Poland, which has decided not to import any more Russian gas. So it's built itself an LNG terminal for supply security and diversification reasons. Um, now, if you, if you then ask the question, well, did Poland need to build that terminal? Could it not get gas from elsewhere? No, it didn't need to, but it took a policy decision to do that. We're seeing some of that in Eastern Europe as well, so, uh, Southeast Europe, new terminals are being built. Um, in order to in order to diversify away from particularly Russian gas. But, but in general, I would say a lot of money is being spent, has been spent on security of supply measures um, because the EU and national governments wanted to do that. 
this is this complicates any kind of model because you would call that um, suboptimal economic investments but of course you have to factor in what national governments decide they want to do so I would say that the, the problem may be that if some of these new terminals are built then we will see an increase in cost in the countries that because somebody has to pay for them whether it's taxpayers or bill payers what I was mostly talking about when I said they won't remunerate is is new liquefaction projects so uh, I, I think that if you have an, an existing liquefaction project and you're adding trains to that project then you may well in, be in good shape but if you have a new greenfield project then I think you have to the sponsors will have to be very careful in terms of whether they see the general LNG price going forward remunerating the investment in terminals and also of course how they see um, LNG being priced particularly in Asia in the future. Now I'm, I made reference to the JCC JKT pricing but of course you know, if if importers are going to continue to base their LNG prices on oil then they have an additional risk challenge to work out what will happen in the oil market and and whether in fact if the oil price goes up significantly whether LNG will remain competitive in the markets into which they're selling their LNG well, thank you very much for that answer. And I think you answered another question that has been asked about the Greenfield project. So, uh, Rocio, for the next one. Yeah, we are having many questions. Uh, Mr. Stern, could you switch on the camera, perhaps? Oh, when uh, oh so it's I, better. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I don't know what happened. Okay, thank you. sorry, I don't know how that got switched off. Okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we are having more questions now on the. Um, there's, there's some question saying that there's a lot of utilities in Southeast Asia still using coal fire power stations. So how will the issue of air pollution eventually affect the LNG use? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. You know, in our work, we've stressed that in, in Asia, air pollution and affordability are much more important issues uh, on government agendas than um, carbon reduction, uh, at least at present. And I think we've seen the, the, the improvement in China with, with coal to gas switching. Um, we haven't really seen the improvement in India in coal to gas switching that many of us were thinking would happen. Um, but in a lot of Asian countries, the difficulty of, of trying to switch from coal is something we're very familiar with in, in Europe in terms of domestic employment, a regional employment, but also the notion, which can now I think be challenged, that coal is very cheap and LNG is expensive. And here we have the legacy of that period in the 2010s when LNG, particularly in the Pacific, was extremely expensive. And this to some extent scarred the reputation of LNG in many countries we said well you know it's nice to have but it's far too expensive for us. Um, I'm hoping that this period will have changed that view but a lot of that will depend I think on the change of pricing moving away from oil related pricing and towards market pricing of, of LNG. Not that market pricing um, as it were, assures you of a low price. But what it does is it allows you to work out what you think the dynamics of the gas and LNG market will be. But back to the coal, the coal situation. I think the worrying thing in Asia is that in a number of countries, new coal plants are still being built, all right, less than we thought would be built maybe five years ago. And once these countries have built new coal plants, they are likely to run for a very long time. So coal is coal is most certainly not dead in Asia. And uh, what I think you would hope is that for additional demand, energy demand, 
which cannot be satisfied by renewables. And I'm talking mainly here about industrial demand rather than power. Uh, the choice would be LNG rather than coal. I have a few other questions for this turn. I know the, um, we're running on schedule, so I'll take this opportunity to ask like three questions in one, if I may. Okay. Uh, I have questions related in uh, in your question uh, that you've put, but without replying, in this, how far liberalized gas, uh, the liberalized mar gas markets are appropriate in the decarbonization uh, in Europe, and how far are the current models still appropriate? Um, so you asked a question, but uh, some panel, some some attendees and myself as well would like to see your view, hear your views on that. <laughs> okay. Um, and coupled with that, a uh, more technical one is: uh, Would the use of waste called in terminals be a one answer of a answer to that? Um, and the last one, which um, I'm also interested in hearing, what is put by the panelists. How do you see the development of the terminal regulation in the future? Okay, um, let me start with the big question. Um, and this is, uh, I think, maybe, maybe this is not the answer that Sayer would want to hear. Um, if, if net zero targets are going to be implemented and are going to be successful, I believe that we don't have to throw out all of our competitive um, uh, energy regulation that we've been that we've been developing over the last 30 years but net zero targets and decarbonization need to become the overriding priority and that will mean that a lot of the competitive um, regulation that we have been developing uh, may have to be changed in, in other words if we're going to if we're going to introduce decarbonized um, gases, um, if we're going to uh, achieve sector integration uh, with electricity and gas, then in my view, it will not be possible to do that within a competitive framework initially. Eventually, um, as we see more sources of hydrogen, possibly biomethane, um, emerging then maybe competitive markets will develop. Um, I know that I've heard many EU speakers talk about the need to maintain competition, but I think this is an emphasis that, that will quickly be recognized. You know, the, the, the most important thing, if we're going to achieve these targets, is to make sure that we get decarbonized gases into our energy system as quickly as possible. I don't see how we can do that through the kind of competitive model we have currently. Of course, you can have auctions of different projects. Yes, you can, but um, I don't. I don't see how the the kind of network competition within networks is going to operate. I think it'll be very difficult. Um, waste cold, yes, um, and I mean a lot of that happens has been happening in Asia for a very long time. Whether it will make a major contribution, I'm not sure. But we need to we need to utilise whatever we can in relation to um, waste and and indeed any other um, any other sources that we have. De development of terminal regulation. Um, I'm I'm kind of going to leave this to others partly because I think the whole the whole of the next session is is dealt with this. But it, it just feeds into what I've said earlier about the liberalised model. I'm I'm not convinced that this is going to be a major priority in a decarbonizing European um, energy market. So what we have in the NGO and academic community is a very considerable resistance to, to LNG in general because of their views, which I think we can all disagree with, that actually what we need to do is to phase out gas, phase out LNG uh, in general. What I think the LNG community needs to understand is that um, this kind of very detailed regulation, and you know, we've we've published a big study of this last year. Uh, we have the uh, we have the EU study published in May talking about how this should change. When you read this as a, as a 
as a general energy reader, your question is, yes, but what's this got to do with the overriding uh, priority, which is net zero? And I, I think that's something the LNG community has got to get to grips with, which is, um, you know, this level of detail is very interesting. And for those of us who've been around a long time, uh, you know, we're, we're we're what's kind of deeply involved in it and obviously the commercial side is your speakers in the next session are going to talk about this but it's it's problematic for the overall view of how the european energy sector needs to decarbonize and uh, i'm not I, i'm not certain um how much priority is going to continue to be given to this um in as as the commission unfolds its decarbonization program well thank um, you very much please. for the answers um i'm just keeping yeah. an eye on, on the watch so maybe Russia, yeah. if you have one final question that you put to mr yeah. stern and then we can move on for the first panel yeah we we are receiving many questions now um also we are receiving extensive thank yous for mr stern for the nice presentation uh so i'm going to make uh, a last one um, one of the attendants uh, asked if uh, are we are you expecting the development of regional LNG price market that could replace the oil price link in LNG supply contracts? Well, I, I'm I'm one of those people who's been talking about this and 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 suggesting it for a long time, uh, and I, I've I've said this in many forum in Asia when I was able to when I was able to go to Asia. Um, Essentially, you know, we all understand how the JCC framework evolved, and we can all, I think, agree that back in the 1970s and 1980s, um, this was this was an okay system, very much as in Europe, um, the the um, uh, the fuel oil linkage, uh, gas oil linkage, was appropriate when it was it when it was created. The problem is that it is now not appropriate. I mean, if you if you think about why anyone is linking, even in Japan, the price of LNG to the price of crude oil, never mind in other Asian countries. The big problem we face is that we have not got liberalized markets in Asia. We have the start in, in China. We have a start in Japan, but we, we don't have a start elsewhere. Um, Singapore is liberalized market, but unfortunately it's not large enough and it's slightly in the geographically wrong position. So when you speak, when you speak to LNG exporters and you say, well, we need to move to a market price, they say, what market price? We don't see a market price. JKM has provided a very useful start as a benchmark. But, and here I'm here I'm talking about um, a big conceptual debate in our community, in some more, more academic communities, is a benchmark sufficient or do you need a hub? And, and our view is you need national hubs because JKM, as good as it is, can never be more than an approximation of prices across Asia. Whereas what you need, because you know the Japanese market is different to the Chinese market is different to the Korean market, you need a market price in each of those countries. And the only way you can get that is to have a hub which will provide you with price discovery. Um, but for that, you need liberalization, you need exchanges. We have the start of exchanges in some of those countries, but we're not there yet. And I have to say, I think the progress over the last few years has been disappointing. So it's really up to the utilities, the governments in the importing countries to decide um, are they going to liberalize? Are they going to create a hub which will provide a, price, a market price discovery uh, marker for LNG? To the extent that they don't, and we continue to rely on oil, we're probably going to see higher prices in Asia than would be strictly necessary. Thank you, Mr. Stern. I think uh, this is going to be all. I mean, we have uh, finished our time, unfortunately, because there's still some more interesting questions. 
So now we need to move into the next, uh, into okay. the first panel. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much, much guys. Mr. Sir, for your participation. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so if we move into the second panel, Agustin uh, is going to be the one sharing uh, uh, the second panel. Please, Agustin, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Professor Stern, for your very stimulating intervention, as always. It is out of any doubt that the LNG market will keep bringing us many interesting things to analyze and challenging forecasts uh, to do for many years. It's out of any doubt. Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Agustin Alonso. I work at the Spanish regulator, the CNMC, and the Natural Gas Department, where I am mainly involved in national regulation development and monitoring. I have also been actively involved in LNG regulatory issues at European level as a member of CER LNG work stream for many years. And that's all uh, from my side. Okay, I don't want to take the time of the participants in this panel that surely have uh, very interesting thoughts and information to continue illustrating our minds. So I am very honored uh, to introduce this first panel of the webinar which will be mainly focused on LNG regulation at European level. In particular, we will have the opportunity to listen to the European Commission vision of thoughts on the LNG sector. And maybe we will be able to answer to the question about if there is or not a necessity to amend European legislation affecting LNG. We will also be able to look at the access to the European LNG terminals from a trader perspective, not only to regulated but also to exempted terminals, having some inputs on the pros and cons from different access regimes, best practices, etc. Uh, furthermore, CER will give us his views on current regulatory challenges considering the so fast uh, change in LNG market context as European and European uh, world level, uh, using uh, also for that uh, real examples on how these uh, challenges are being addressed. Um, finally, uh, we didn't want to lose the opportunity also to take a look to the recent trends in small scale and virtual LNG services in European terminals from a regulatory perspective. Analyzing also some examples about different uh, regimes, uses, flexibilities, uh, etc. Okay, following the same directions uh, before, uh, as Rocío already told, for those who are interested in participating, please submit your questions in the chat provided for this, and we will try to go through all the questions at the end of the panel. I hope you enjoy the session. Let's uh, start uh, with Mr. Lucas that will join us through the telephone line. Uh, okay, uh, Lucas, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, perfect. So let me introduce uh, first uh, Gerald CV, a little resume, and, and then I will let you give your speech. Okay, Mr. Lucas is a master graduate uh, of the Center of, for Europe at the University of Warsaw and Warsaw School of Economics. He has a remarkable experience on energy regulation from different perspectives. As he has worked as a consultant, he has been actively involved in some energy programs organized, for example, by US Department of State. He has also provided, uh, uh, he has worked uh, in, the in the Natural Gas Department at Acer, also for the Polish Ministry of Energy. And currently he works uh, at the European Commission within DG Energy where he deals with the internal energy market, in particular uh, with uh, natural gas and LNG related issues. Okay, I want to thank you, Lucas, for accepting our invitation to participate in the webinar. And the floor is yours, Lucas. Thank you very much, uh, Augustine. Good morning and apologies for joining only uh, via the telephone, but uh, I had some uh, technical issues. So I, I hope it will be, all would be understandable and, and uh, manageable. So. Uh, yeah, I would uh, I would di directly uh, dive into the presentation. I think uh, the, the the general point and the big questions has been uh, has been asked at the beginning, and I think we we would definitely come back into that into our discussion. But I would still 
I uh, would like to present uh, um, the, the views based on the on the study which which the consultants have conducted for us. So maybe a few smaller issues here and there, but uh, I think it's always good to start with the uh, with the with the smaller issues and then uh, developing to the to the bigger bigger questions. So let's uh, let's dive into the uh, the presentation. So uh, if we can go to the first slide, so that the just the disclaimer and uh, just to say that this study was uh, conducted by the by the consortium of the consultants led by Trinomics and together with REC and Inquidity. So we we asked to to make uh, this study for the for for us for DGNR last year. As Professor Stern rightly said, it was published uh, this May. So of course context was a bit different. Uh, when we started, uh, for various reasons, of course, the the, the green deal, the the pandemics, etc. So, uh, yeah, main um, main um, tasks of the study. So, if we could go to to the next slide. Uh, so, the aim was to I, um, identify and analyze any uh, existing shortcomings at, at the barriers on the LNG uh, entry and eff effective competition as obviously proposed some recommendations and measures how to address them and uh, the the quantity part is as well um, there i think which is which is a very strong point of the of the study so a lot of interesting uh, modeling and uh, and results and the study was working under the assumption of the two scenarios so um, uh, the we called it so the, the consultants called it intra terminal competition um, when you have the different players competing to, to use the service offered as a specific terminal and inter-terminal competition when you have competition uh, basically between between the terminals in order to uh, to to basically assess different uh, different options and different developments and as i said the the studies i would i would call it on the purely regulatory uh, re regulatory focus so it did not take uh, into account this um, Mm, let's say the decarbonization uh, part of the of the LNG. Uh, this was uh, as well a bit. So this decarbonization part was a bit discussed in the Madrid Forum. Uh, the, the GIE was was as well asked by the Madrid Forum to to present the study. But as far as I saw, this would be as well the the part of the of the next panel. So uh, uh, here is the mainly I would say classic regulatory uh, regulatory uh, issues. So uh, let's move to the next slide, uh, shortcomings and measures to address them. I have, and we could uh, go to the next one directly, so capacity allocation and tariff levels. So I, I grouped those two, um, those two together. So uh, firstly, I would say uh, you can see on the, on, on the left, uh, left hand side, the, the box with the uh, with with the shortcomings uh, that have has been identified, so the short term uh, uh, first party access to to several terminals capacity can only be secured by registered users and secondary market. I think I will not not go uh, one by one uh, by them, but I think here um, the the main the main point, and if you look at the at the right hand side on the considered potential uh, measures here the consultants are uh, are going towards the i would say the root of the of the um, minimum harmonization because obviously we don't have uh, the same rules as for the interconnection pipelines capacity allocation and uh, here the the first uh, the first um, recommendation is to implement harmonized market-based primary capacity allocation mechanism with standard products, et cetera. Uh, therefore, here the, the considered, let's say the connected part obviously is the, is the tariff. So introduction of harmonized tariff principle structures at the terminal services level. So uh, mm, similar to the ones that we have on the, let's say interface with the, uh, with the TSOs and um, uh, and uh, stimulate the cost benchmarking at the at the European level. So I think uh, mm, mm, as well, uh, what I haven't mentioned, which is a quite interesting uh, recommendation, is 
as well the the ones we are speaking about harmonization is the auctioning of the of the capacity uh, on the on the single single platform platforms uh, per per market uh, per market area. So that's um, that's the capacity capacity allocation and tariff, which which I think goes uh, mainly towards the increasing increasing transparency and uh, let's say minimum uh, uh, attempt of the of the of maybe not minimum but some kind of attempt to harmonize the 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 capacity allocation uh, but as you can see it's not going that far as saying we need to have uh, equal rules as for the interconnection so if we go to the next slide please that's the information um, transparency and exemptions and i think here the um, let's say the the, um, the low hanging fruit and majority i i, I assume would uh, uh, would uh, would agree that of course many uh, many has been already achieved and and improved uh, in terms of in terms of trans transparency uh, but but still there is some some room for improvement and definitely transparency would be the uh, would be would be the the obvious um, let's say choice as i said uh, kind of a low hanging uh, fruit so here as well the same logic on the left hand side key shortcomings and uh, on the on the right hand side uh, measures and i will i will as well go briefly through the measures which is which is i think in the this short time a bit more uh, interesting so um the the one the, the first one is to mandate to develop the um, and implement the centralized transparency platform so the one could imagine the similar one as as uh, as transparency platform that we that we are having now developed by the NCG and uh, then of course the the purpose is to enhance transparency and by require by publicating uh, uh, specific metrics uh, and uh, yeah that's uh, that's uh, that's basically it i think everyone could imagine how this could uh, look like and here as well the the link on the exemptions so the the uh the um the exemptions of course uh, taking into account all the all the legal certainty and the existing exemptions uh, uh here the the recommendation uh, from the consultants was to uh, review or yeah, assess think about the the adjustment to the existing requirements and criteria for the new exemptions to include uh, more uh, more requirements uh, regarding transparency uh, in particular tariffs and capacity allocation contractual terms etc so as you see here the here is a, here is the, the strong link with the with the with the transparency part um so yeah i think that that's all about this slide and we can now um, jump into the next one which is uh, service offerings and the small scale uh so uh, uh here uh, here as well some uh, some more i would say uh, general uh general recommendations to to stimulate to ensure availability of different uh, types of capacity products so i, I think the, the guiding principle is here uh, that it's not that uh, bundled or unbundled products are better or worse it's um, it all depends on the on the market needs and uh, i think the key is to to ensure that flexibility and reduce any potential barriers that would basically undermine this um, this flexibility so the the more flexibility and the uh, responding to the market needs um, the better with with that uh, uh, regard here is as well uh, quite an interesting uh, um, idea uh, to uh, to allow the specific storage regulation so to 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 offer additional unbundled on unbundled storage capacity but uh, not uh, here we are not speaking about the storage in the terminal as such but the UG, UGS uh, so the, the, there have been already some uh, some discussions uh, in Europe uh, 
about that and what what came out from the study that in some cases there might be um there might be some preventive uh measures regulation to to allow to that so it's here is basically to lift uh to lift the barriers and that's that's of course the 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 measure that would uh, try to um, Ad, um, address the issue of the of the of the congestion congestion and additional volumes um, uh, here as well. So the small scale, uh, but this this I think Eve will will speak about that uh, in the panel later on. But that's of course so that's on one hand small uh, small part of the of the LNG sector, but nevertheless growing and very very promising. So. What is clear that that's basically the I think the, the guiding question is how to incentivize and uh, make it happen um, basically. Uh, so here the idea was connected to the to the first slide on the capacity allocation. So to provide uh, so by enhancing transparency and requiring to 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 provide via central transparency platform the data on the on the small scale so that that the link with the with the transparency aspect and uh, the second one for the small scale uh, was to basically to as well include it in this uh, booking platform uh, potentially uh, that I have been mentioning on under the first slide so not only the primary and secondary capacity but as well the um, the small um, the small scale so that that was the recommendation uh the last next slide please is the market access and market liquidity which basically i put it as the last one because it's not directly linked as such to, to the lng uh, lng sector it's more the i would say the more more horizontal um, more horizontal uh part so i, I think it's not that uh, um, let's say it, it's not key for LNG, but more for the for the horizontally for the for the gas market. So I think we could go to the model's impact of selected potential measures uh, and to the slide when we have the modeling results in the nutshell. So obviously uh, you could dive into the study, which I which I really recommend. But I think here I I took the two. Uh, two, let's say, in my view, most important um, conclusions. So, A, that the modeling results indicate that the implementation of most measures would decrease the weighted average gas price for the EU 28, um, and that introducing the considered measures would, in general, positively impact the terminal utilization. And then you have in the study, of course, all the tables showing per measures how it would impact market competition uh, and but the effective size of the impact would highly depend obviously and i think that was mentioned uh, clearly as well by professor stern earlier on the global and european lng uh, lng um, market conditions so that's uh, in that sense i think uh, that shows that at least to us that this uh, this measures um are worth to be to be considered and and further assessed uh and we could uh, dive to the jump into the last slide so the main conclusions when the, when we have the basically five of them so summarizing what what i have said uh here and what what uh, study show so i think the first one is the on the transparency so to to assess the option of developing the the eu wide information slash transparency platform mm, the second um, second conclusion is that uh, um, that uh, yeah to enhance competition uh, one option would be to to assess the possibility to, to implement the primary primary capacity allocation via via auctioning and the standard products so this part of the let's say uh, some kind of harmonization further harmonization uh, then we have as well the the num number three so the third conclusion 
refers as well to the um, to the secondary capacity uh, bookings. I would say we have so that that's on purpose. So one would be the transparency, second one the primary, the third one uh, secondary uh, capacity um, bookings and. Uh, um, and uh, an improvement introducing harmonized uh, reallocation uh, procedures then the number four uh, is the basically to reassess the, the the criteria for the for the for the um, for the exemptions connected to the um, to the transparency issues and uh, um, and the fifth uh, links to the uh, service services offered and the, and the small scale, where basically, as I said, the guiding principles should be flexibility and uh, and uh, answering to to the to the to the market uh, to the market needs. And here, an idea: if one would decide to go towards this uh, platforms uh, booking uh, route. Then, then the small scale could be uh, could be as well uh, as well part of it, or maybe just only small scale, not primary, etc. So, um, so that's the um, that's the kind of the end uh, end of the study. You have a link. I assume many many of you have already seen that, and probably I I can anticipate one question which has been already asked. And what now? What what would be done with that? So just maybe twenty seconds. Basically, so, so as always, this is the, the consultant view, which we are kind of digesting and analyzing and um, as well discussing with the, with, the, with the stakeholders. We start this in the last Madrid forum and the discussion will be ongoing. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's obviously not that straightforward to answer uh, is the change in the current regulatory framework uh, for LNG needed. Uh, then I think from the study you could see that there is uh, some room for improvement, uh, and uh, especially around the transparency and, and booking, maybe a bit addressing the congestion question, which Rocio will will speak later on. So there is a room from for improvement, and we are we are basically assessing uh, assessing the the options, uh, the all the options now, and I think the study is good a uh, good food for food for thought. So I think I was a bit too long, Augustine. So uh, please uh, uh, forgive me. But that's that's the end. Thank thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lucas. In fact, uh, you already uh, answered one of the questions that was uh, your last uh, part of intervention. So you anticipated uh, one of them. I have uh, some others that I will ask at the end of the panel. So next uh, participant, uh, now is the turn of Mr. Jose Simon, who will give us uh, the vision of the access to European energy terminals from a trader perspective. Jose is okay. Managing Director Europe at Pavilion Energy and uh, concurrently Global Head of Energy Portfolio and Europe Trading. At his current role, he's responsible for overseeing its European gas trading and global energy portfolio management and for the organization of business divisions. Uh, he brings with him a wealth of experience in the natural gas industry from his former roles in mainly in Iberdrola, uh, the energy Spanish company. Uh, for example, uh, he has held other leadership uh, positions, including negotiation for long term contracts as well as capacity contracts in exemptive terminals. So uh, thank you very much, Jose, for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Agustin. Thank you as well, Sir, for having invited me to participate in such a very interesting uh, event. Um, first of all, let me uh, check, uh, Agustin, if uh, you have passed me the controls. Uh, I could appreciate if it is possible. I, th I think so. Uh, okay. Just click on the slide once and you can proceed. Okay. Great. So, first of all, I think it is needed to introduce Pavilion to the audience as our company has been active in the European natural gas sector hardly for one year as of today. So, 
Um, however, during the, the last month, uh, we have taken some important steps uh, to show how critical the presence and, and the development of our position within the European gas sector means. Um, just for the background, Pavilion was founded in Singapore only six years ago. Uh, we are definitely a young company, I would rather say, even we are in our infancy, which uh, is somehow being in the, in the learning process. Uh, can be something positive um, as uh, you are not limited or bound by some other parts of uh, your historical business or for your legacy positions or whatever. So in somehow we are free to take the decisions that business-wise we, con we consider are positive for our company. In the, in the early years, I mean in six years ago, the focus uh, was pretty much uh, uh, to build a strong foothold in the emerging LNG sector in Singapore, but also in the Southeast region, in the Southeast region, as well as building some industrial uh, customer base for uh, selling the, the gas in Singapore. Um, nevertheless, uh, acknowledging the need of having a global dimension to, to succeed in the LNG sector, one year ago, Pavilion acquired the whole Iberdrola LNG assets, including its uh, long-term contracts, the Riga's position in Spain and in UK, uh, some uh, uh, LNG vessel contracts, interconnection between Spain and France, and some other elements in the portfolio. In parallel, uh, we started setting up our European office in Spain, actually here in Madrid, and it's now up and running with uh, more than 30 professionals coming from 11 different nationalities. Uh, I want also to make clear that our aim is to use Madrid as the beachhead to be in the short run one of the main players in the European energy scene. At a glance, uh, main elements and figures to share could be that Pavilion is 100% uh, owned by Temasek, which is one of the funds of Singapore, uh, counting for close to 300 billion investment portfolio. Um, I mean, um, Temasek, of course, not, not Pavilion. And in Pavilion, we, we count for around 150 employees based in our two headquarters, as I mentioned before, Singapore and Madrid. In terms of volumes, uh, we manage a long-term contract portfolio of uh, natural gas and LNG of around 8 BCM per year. We source it from Nigeria, uh, US, Indonesia, Norway, and some others. Uh, LNG out of these 8 BCMs means more or less 6.5 BCM. In terms of Riga's positions, we, we manage our LNG supplies in Spain, in Singapore, but also we have uh, capacity on a long term, on a, on a long term basis in, in UK, in the Isle of Rain uh, Riga's terminal, counting for around uh, 2.7 BCM a year of annual capacity. We operate a fleet of uh, six LNG tankers, uh, five conventional ones, and one which is a typical small scale uh, devoted for bunkering uh, purposes, uh, which is, if I remember well, around uh, 14 cubic meters. And in addition, uh, in the European gas markets, we operate on a wholesale basis. We are operated in UK, in Spain, in Netherlands, and in France. We are taking our first steps. Just uh, also as a one uh, important element, how we are uh, committed to the development of the European gas market is that we are currently the, the, the LNG market maker for the mid gas market here in Spain. So to summarize, uh, Pavilion is a young actor in the global natural gas scene that uh, we have a clear view about the key role that our sector has to play in the energy transition, but also acknowledging that in order to succeed, it is a must to adapt to the new requirements that the society calls for the energy players. Undoubtedly, European is for us one of the pillars of our strategy. Okay, so uh, as a snapshot regarding, regarding the European LNG terminals is seen, uh, although sometimes we have been considered uh, they are kind of stranded assets, Nowadays, they are growing in number and also in, in the level of utilization, which, which I think is healthy for, 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 the, for the sector and also for the, for the competitiveness in the industry. How is that? Because uh, we are in a period of years, as Professor Stern mentioned before, LNG now is abundant, it's access, accessible, and also is pricing competitive. 
which is um, uh, supporting the, the natural growth in gas demand due to the switch uh, from, for example, coal to gas in power generation. And hence, it's in somehow closing the, the circle. In some markets, LNG regards are essential for the balance of the system and the security of supply, such as Spain and France. In some others, they represent a perfect tool as an option to the traditional pipeline. So we might say that uh, LNG terminals are in somehow changing the gas business rational. First, in terms of geostrategy, because gas uh, will play a fundamental role in the future EU energy supply mix. This is something that is starting to be recognized even by the, the authorities and by the regulators. And also uh, because the European Commission is uh, quite uh, clearly supporting the LNG to, to increase not only because of the supply, the security of supply and diversification, but also it is encouraging its use in specific sectors for, for sustainability reasons. For example, in terms of the, the maritime sector with, with the, the, the bunkering uh, role. In terms of uh, economic development, in the past, gas markets were national markets and only certain countries could benefit from competitive gas prices to leverage their economic growth. But in terms of uh, competitiveness, historically, only a reduced group of large players could afford significant investments and long-term contracts to achieve competitive advantages. Now, LNG terminals have started to provide the flexibility to encourage the spot market development, providing all the agents, even the small ones, with new trading opportunities without being exposed to long-term risks. So um, the four essential elements that I will uh, develop one by one further or uh, features that we can see in the Eurogas terminals are first that they, the, the market they are providing access to, second, the regulation around third, the capacity allocation rules, and fourth, then what we can call the toolkit that usually offered additional service. So let us in view, let us have a, a, a view in detail, so one by one. So uh, in terms of um, um, a, how can we categorize the access to the markets, uh, we can say that we find some terminals that provide access to not just one single market, the one that is physically connected to the terminal, but to some others that are farther down the, the line, which for sure improves uh, ultimately the competition. This is something, for example, if we think about the Seabridge terminal in Belgium, it is not only just giving access to the Belgian market, but also to the markets in UK, Netherlands, Germany, or France. In the same sense, in the same sense uh, there are markets with several terminals, for example, Spain is uh, the paradigm, uh, which are encouraging the competition between them. Um, and even now that we, uh, as uh, I will explain it uh, further, the regulator and the system operator have launched this single virtual scheme, which is even making more uh, valuable the competition among different uh, agents in the market. However, some other terminals, uh, in theory, that are better positions in other markets are fully booked in the, long, in the long run. Most of them, the ones that are under the regime of exemption, for example, those in UK like uh, South Hook or Isle of Grain. Uh, apart from that, there are some other elements that are usually present in the European terminals, which are highly remarkable in comparison to some others over the world. First, uh, in most of cases, they provide with a robust physical interconnection infrastructure that grants downstream market opportunities and reduce the technical or operational constraints during the operations. And it's not only that, there are some other terminals, for example, Sea, Rouge, Gate, Dunker, that are very active in the trans ship in the transshipment activities due to its strategic location, for example, just for managing the LNG volumes coming from Jamal. Okay, regulation-wise, sorry, regulation-wise, I'm not going to, to stop too much uh, here because it has already been uh, explained and sufficiently detailed by uh, my previous colleague, but we have first the regulated versus the exempted terminals. The open access is granted 
on regulated terminals by the European Directive under non-discriminatory conditions. Tariffs are approved by the national regulator and then published. Uh, in terms of exemption, there are six, thermal, six terminals today within the European scene, which are Isle of Grain, Dragon and South Hook in UK, Dunkirk in France, Robigo in Italy, and Gates in Netherlands. Regarding tariffs, the regulated ones don't follow the same structure with different charges from sim for similar services. For example, uh, in terms of uh, slots, uh, nowadays, uh, the, the OL OLT Toscana slots are nearly six times the, the, the price that they paid in, in Seabrook in Belgium. And in terms of exempted terminals, they set their own tariffs on a negotiated basis, uh, and they are not required to, to publish them. So they negotiate contracts directly with the traders. And the last element, which is transparency and comparability to highlight, uh, the exempted terminals are not obliged to publish the same information as the regulated ones. Um, more traders are operating in regulated terminals, uh, but for example, Dunker capacity is mainly booked by two companies, which are PDF and Total. And regarding uh, primary versus secondary capacity, the primary holders, they get to get it uh, either by open season procedures like a South Hook, Kyle of Grain, Dragon, Cisnes, uh, first committed, first served, like in Gravitus and Greece or Seabridge, uh, by auctions, for example, the last one that has been made in Spain and some other previously in Italy, and also by the combination of, the, of any of the above. For example, GATE applies open season procedures and then first committed, first serves to allocate available capacity. And as far as secondary capacity is concerned, uh, there is always the tend to maximize terminals operation by making a new capacity available to the market. It is not in place for all terminals. Uh, and also the use it or lose it mechanisms to reallocate a new capacity are quite always in place in the short term. Uh, for example, some countries are obliged to sell it like Belgium or pay for it like Spain. And finally, short-term versus long-term capacity. So long-term slots are mainly allocated via primary capacity and in, ma in many cases to the accepted ones. Why? Because they were, let's say, the anchor that was needed in the, mo in the, in the moments that the decision to build that, that, those rigorous terminals, they were the anchor to finance the project. So in most of cases, they were linked to long-term contracts that were on a cheap or a cheap or use or pay basis. And the shippers were obliged to commit to pay for whatever it was, 20 years, 15 years, the full duration of the contract to pay for their slots. Uh, but it is also possible to book short-term capacity in some other primary markets, for example, Spain and Italy. And last, about these four main features, there is something that is becoming to, is to be a, a differential factor of the European terminals in comparing with some others uh, around the world. Uh, the expanded services, well, versus the, the, the traditional, what we call uh, standard services, which are unloading, storage, and rigas services, or bundle or unbundling, we have the expanded services, which are, uh, becoming to be something usual and easy to find in terminals, for example, in Western European countries like UK, Netherlands, Belgium, France, and Spain, uh, that they have developed market leading service offerings. Which are these offerings? The small scale services that we are thinking of, which are, for example, the truck or rail loading or loading of anchoring ships that facilitate the use of gas in certain new niche downstream markets or additional flexibility services, for example, providing LNG storage or shipment. And uh, I think uh, there is still some. Uh, could you put um, the, 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 slap, the slide back, uh, Agustin, if possible? Okay, because I think it's okay. Go to uh, um, this one. So let's, let's move to the next one, please. Next one, yeah, okay, that's it. As you may know, um, the Spanish LNG sector is one of the most, uh, let's say, experienced in, in terms of regas operations in Europe. 
Uh, nevertheless, in the last year, the regulator and the system operator, they have promoted a radical change to accomplish with the adaptation of the system to the new LNG market uh, paradigm. Uh, we as Pavilion were supportive, uh, fully in alignment. Uh, however, uh, there are still some gray zones to be tackled urgently. Um, I'm sure that uh, further on it would be uh, explained this, what is the, 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 the meaning of this change into kind of a virtual rigorous system applying to the whole market and just operating all the terminals in one. Uh, but uh, there has been some elements that, are, of course, has to be uh, implement some final uh, tune adjustment. Uh, for example, we welcome the slot auctions that the regulations have implemented. They are good, and they, the rigorous price that reflect the real value that the market gives to it. Uh, but uh, if uh, the operators are paying this price, but at the same time, the existing tariff is not uh, being reduced accordingly, so it would be uh, meaning an artificial increase in the total regulated cost, which logically is diminishing the attractiveness for the LNG operators to come to Spain. And in parallel, it's likely to bring over some uh, potential increase in the gas price for the final customers. Next, please. Okay, next. So one by one, um, just a conclusion um, as kind of takeaways from a trader perspective. I would like to share with you all the following ones. First, uh, mainly due to the LNG oversupply that I think that is here to stay for years, the Rigos terminals are no longer stranded assets in Europe, but an essential element for the markets and also for the LNG players. Uh, second, when the Rigos is linked to a liquid half, uh, to have access to capacity is the only route for LNG traders to monetize the, the LNG cargoes. And third, in the past, the key element for selling the LNG was to have the granted demand either by means of having customers or through sales to the final combined cycles or power plant. That was where utilities were controlling the positions because it was a must for them to, to grant it the security of supply. Uh, now, this is uh, changing completely with the uh, uh, emerging, the emergence of uh, liquid hubs, because they are acting as the meeting, for, the meeting point for both LNG traders and utilities. And then the, the access to the rigas capacity has become an essential element for the trading business and not anymore so relevant for utilities for matching with the security of supply obligation. And I think that's uh, all from myself. So I look forward for any questions. Agustin, give you the floor. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jose. And now uh, let's go directly to the next uh, participant in the panel, which is Rocío Pietro, who you already know. So I will not make a presentation of her. Please, Rocio, whenever you want. Uh, she will speak us about the current regulatory challenges from CER perspective. Thank you very much, Agustin. I'm going to speak uh, very quickly about some of the subjects that food regulators are important. Some of the previous speakers already referred to it, so I'm not going to be uh, long in much. Uh, so, CER in the past uh, has been working on the uh, back in 2017 and, and 2016 uh, we were working in ways to remove barriers for the LNG markets because we thought that uh, it was going to to be difficult to have cargos in Europe with high prices in, and high demand in Asia so we were looking into ways to attract as much as possible gas into the European markets in order to uh, to increase competition for the sake of the European consumers. Now we are all the way, <laughs> the things have changed and uh, um, what we need to do is to adapt the, the LNG terminal services to what is happening. We have plenty of gas, so what we are doing is to, to try to have a proactive role in following what is happening uh, in the market. So identify solutions to real problems. So if there is more gas, there is more uh, traders, there's more competition, we need to anticipate what is going to happen and what the needs of the market are. So as uh, it has been said, two years ago we were, we were in Europe in an underutilization 
context of LNG terminals. And now we have much more gas in the market, of course, uh, a bit stopped with the COVID-19 situation. Nevertheless, uh, as it has been said, uh, the increase of utilization of the terminals has been huge. Beginning of 2018, we have below 20% of utilization of the terminals, which pose important problems, not only in terms of competition and liquidity in the market, but also with technical problems and recovery investment problems for, for several markets. So this is also a problem of, uh, for, for the regulators. Uh, now we, we see that the, the level of utilization has increased a lot in a certain market like Italian, uh, the, the Italian market or the French market. This has reached almost 100% of e utilization. So when we talk about, sorry, sorry, I have a problem moving slightly the presentation. So um, the general um, objectives uh, for, for the regulators has been always the same no matter the situation. For us, what is important is secure the supply, diversification of sources and diversification of infrastructures is one of the key issues when talking about security supply for the European market. And we are having not having problem with that uh, lately with more much more LNG coming. Uh, when you have different sources and different infrastructures, you have more players in the market, therefore competition improves. And for the competition uh, to work fine, so for traders to interact and shippers to compete, we need to have non-discriminatory access to infrastructures, no matter if we are having uh, a lot of LNG coming into Europe or less. Uh, and we need to maximize the utilization of the of the LNG terminals, not only in the percentage of utilization, but on the capabilities of the LNG terminals and the installation to provide the service the market needs. Uh, so the service portfolio that the terminals should be offering should match uh, market requirements at, uh, quickly. And for that, it's key to have transparency in how we uh, market uh, the capacity, how we use the terminals, uh, how we price the services. Um, apart from that, uh, as regulators, we also are working in understanding uh, if the LNG infrastructure might be redundant or not in the market and how the LNG infrastructure are going to be paid. So how this investment we have been made along many years, but still very young in some countries, like from instance in Poland, from Lithuania, uh, how we are going to be paying back. Because in the end, it's the consumers who are going to be paying for, for all of this. Nevertheless, we believe that the, one of the key things is the flexibilization of the use of capacity and, and the adaptation of the market needs. So talking about service, uh, I think we have seen, as uh, Jose Simon has said before, uh, that European terminals are developing more services. We are, in the past, we used to have bundle service uh, for, uh, with a very um, same scheme, probably different in each country, but same scheme of utilization of the terminals. And we are seeing how terminals are developing new services and bundle services and different choices for the utilization of the same service for consumers. This needs to be uh, going on adapting with the market participation, with the participation of the LSOs, the shippers, the traders, and the regulators. And also in the, in the coming years, perhaps, we will need to make room for the renewable gases and the hydrogen. Uh, when we talk about Capacity location mechanism, of course, in the past, when we have lower utilization on the market, or when we specifically had less uh, shippers utilizing the terminal, it was sufficient to have first come, first serve. Now, what we are seeing is much more uh, agents trying to use the terminals. And on top of that, uh, they are very different sometimes among themselves. Some of them, they are vertically integrated companies, but others are wholesale market only, or others are going to use small scale services. So I think we, this different service we're going to be offering uh, need to perhaps go into more specific or detailed mechanisms, well designed market-based mechanisms in order to allocate capacity in an efficient and competitive way. 
uh, this bring me to congestion management. Congestion management was not a problem in the past because the utilization of the terminals was low. So basically, some of the terminals used to have secondary capacity markets in order to, to, to be able to use the capacity, if not used uh, by the primary holders. And um, uh, in most of the terminals also, the uh, companies were paying for the uh, capacity. They were booked they had booked it in the past, even if they used it for much. For instance, in the Spanish system, it was not like that. They were only paying for the real utilization of the contracts. Uh, but now that we have a lot of guys in, in many of the European countries, being Europe, as Professor Stern said, uh, the marginal market for LND, now perhaps we are having a new problem, so congestion. So we are having uh, many of the, of the terminals fully booked, uh, there is more demand that we have not been able to attend. So this means that there are others that may be looking into secondary capacity uh, options. Uh, for that, we need to be sure that the, the mechanisms are, are in place. So to attend this demand and assure that the, uh, we make the most of the utilization of the terms. It's a very difficult thing because it may not be sufficient uh, to, to make primary capacity holders to pay for the capacity they have booked in the past if they are not willing to use in the future because perhaps capacity is still cheaper if you compare with the price of gas. Uh, some, some terminals might have penalties in the case the capacity goes and used and are, is not released on time to markets. The traditional congestion management procedures like capacity market procedures of just the loose short term and long term use in pipelines are perhaps tricky to develop, difficult to develop when we speak about discrete services like slot, um, slots for ship unloading. Another good thing about some of the congestion management procedure, uh, well, we have many of them on the pipeline, so the, the good thing is that we can see how they work on the pipelines and see if it would be efficient to, to use it on the LNG terminals. So all over nomination and buyback, maybe, I mean, uh, also uh, a one, uh, the type of mechanism, if we know how to, how to develop how to develop it, it adapted to the terminals, interruptible capacity, surrender of capacity, of course. So we are looking into all of these things for as national regulators, as also as European regulators. Transparency is always um, the main, <laughs> from a regulator's perspective, transparency together with non-discrimination and objective access are the key words. So it's a must, independently on the context. Uh, um, so the transparent, transparency template that most LNG terminals are using, I think is a good example of a nice tool that every terminal in Europe must be using. Um, moving into a small example that uh, Jose Simon has uh, already explained a bit, I'm going to put the example of the congestion problem take into consideration the change we have made in the Spanish system lately. So in the past, uh, we were a country with six independent terminals with the same regulation, same tariffs, same everything, with first call first service for uh, allocation of capacity in each of them independently, um, offering only bundled service related with the send out capacity um, with very uh, low, uh, or, congestion management procedure mechanism, because as I said, people only need to, to pay for the, the, the slots if they use it, for instance. Uh, so we decided that in order to create more competition and in order to foster uh, small players to be in the same level playing field that big players, to create a virtual LNG terminal. So once your uh, vessel arrives, your ship arrives in one of the terminals and unload, now the gas is going to be in a virtual tank, so we have a 20 BCM for virtual capacity there, where people could trade, this is the important thing, to trade uh, and to be able to move the gas from this virtual LNG hub into the PVB, that is the, the hub, gas hub in, in, in Spain quickly, so from the sea into the PVB quickly. So we have created this virtual storage and also change the allocation mechanism. So now we auction 
the standard products for the bundle product starting with the allocation of slots but you are able and most of the traders what they have booked recently is independently serviced so a slot on the one hand um, plus a storage capacity plus regasification or choosing what type of 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 thing they wanted and in different quantities so not necessarily related uh, so we have changed the definition of the service and uh, we are now looking into the congestion management procedure because we have so a lot of capacity there was 100% uh, of the capacity was sold with high prices so having multipliers sometimes uh, in the coming uh, months meaning that there's a lot of demand and that there is a lot of interest for uh, unloading LNG in Europe, in this case, particularly in Spain. We saw capacity for the next 15 years, uh, and there, there is already risk reservation for the next 15 years. This, this is something new in the Spanish system. In the old days, there was plenty of capacity, so shippers didn't book more than one year. Um, so what we have seen, so as quick gains of, of our experience, is that new entrants were allocated the capacity. So not only the 20, uh, 20 25 wholesale players that we used to have at the Spanish market were allocated capacity that in, like in the old times, but newly entered companies are seeing in the Spanish market. So this is something that we think that is good. And also what we have uh, uh, get is that gas has been better distributed along the six LNG terminals because people do not need to choose one terminal to trade with a particular shipper that is in that terminal. Now they can trade and exchange the gas in the six terminals. I hope this is going to create more liquidity and competition for the, for the Spanish market and also for the uh, Iberian has, has develop, development that in the end is the aim, so to, to find better prices for gas consumers. If I finalize with some conclusions and general conclusions, uh, on the one hand, we as SEER, we understand that things need to move forward quickly. So uh, flexibility is the key were for us and we need to adapt quickly to the change in market conditions to the change in market conditions in the european environment in the world environment and particularly in the taking into consideration the peculiarities of each country the, that this will develop the the easily the lng sector in europe so we do not identify uh, a need for deeper regulation uh, in europe that doesn't mean that Things that things don't need to change. So we need things to change and to adapt. Uh, following market needs and the innovation principles. So adapting the rules and adapting the, the concepts in a coordinated way with market collaboration. So we believe that the regulatory regimes, we need to be careful, but because regulatory regimes should not hinder the market development, but must adapt quickly to the changing conditions. So we are asking for further coordination. Uh, among regulators, mainly regarding access. So neighboring countries need to coordinate a bit more, like we do with pipeline gas and with pipeline access conditions, and at, at least at regional level. Uh, also, we need to increase the predictability uh, of, of these exchanges that sometimes I, I reckon is really difficult. Uh, so I think Professor Stern say, well, more or less uh, 2025, I mean, we are going to be with LNG flat supplies to Europe. Uh, I was saying LNG uh, importance will grow in the future. I think will grow in the future. We keep that growth of nine, uh, 20, uh, 2019, 2020. Uh, so still LNG for the next years is going to be a big part of the supply as the supplies in Europe. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to keep uh, developing the LNG services and the, and the LS, LNG access condition and congestion management in order to be able uh, uh, for gas to be an energy transition, transition uh, vector uh, in the future. So I think this all, thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Rocio, for your presentation. 
And now let's move on with uh, Mr. Yves. Yves Poncelet, uh, you already know, as Rocio as well, who participated in the first panel. And Yves will update us about the small scale and LNG virtual services trends in Europe LNG terminals. Please, Yves, the floor is yours. Thank you, Agustin. Um, I'll try to have a control on the slides. It doesn't seem to be working. Oh, yes. Um, so my presentation um, is on the small scale and virtual, virtual energy services and its or not regulation. Uh, a very small reminder because uh, Jose uh, mentioned that one of the success of energy is having access to liquid hubs and having access to via transmission grid to other markets and it took Sabrega as an example which I thank him for that. Um, the small scale re refers to the direct use of LNG as a liquid as opposed to the traditional model of regasification. So the small scale energy does not enter the gas transmission grid. So it's mainly required to consumers that are requiring liquid fuel as such or it's also used to reach places where basically there is no pipeline, so there is no infrastructure to reach those customers. So this is a very quick reminder uh, because we've talked a lot about energy terminals and um, access to the transmission grid to gain access to markets. Small-scale energy have a particular role uh, in this matter. So what would be the uses for small-scale energy? Uh, we have the fuel for road transportation. So typically uh, large truck companies uh, would uh, uh, have their uh, trucks uh, running on uh, LNG with LNG tanks being in the truck. Uh, but also why not some uh, retail, retail and consumers companies for their fleet, which do uh, rides um, in a kind of circular manner. Of in a specific uh, area. Of course, most of it is uh, for the ship bunkering, so we all know that um, um, those vessels that are fuel intensive and follow regular and repetitive, repetitive routes like ferries uh, or point to point cargoes, uh, container ship um, might and probably will use uh, LNG as a fuel. Um, so we compare to the previous very old Bunker C. Um, this is certainly the case in um, European CCA zones or ECA zones as or they will be as from January next year. Um, as I've already mentioned, uh, for industries, energy can be used to um, uh, reach remote areas where um, there is a gas demand, but there is no way to reach it. And has been put as well um, the liquefaction of biomethane, uh, which is um, in the decarbonization strategy, a mean to use LNG um, as a way or as a mean in the decarbonization strategy of the EU. So basically, what is uh, bio, bio LNG is biomethane uh, produced during uh, an aerobic digestion process and then put into LNG or liquid form. Those were uh, uses that were not present like 10 years ago and that are developing rapidly. If um, we look at the current situation in Europe, um, when we look at road transport, and I know I'm moving away from the terminals that we've been discussing, but I'll get back to that um, in a few moments. Uh, we have already uh, 200 energy fueling stations in Europe, and we had 200, 200 last year, and I thank GLE for their data. I know the chairman of GLE is uh, online. They will uh, have his presentation later on. And we have also nine vessels dedicated to uh, ship buckering. We forgot the gas supply to end users. I must say that was used um, on a very exceptional basis um, 20 years ago when um, in the old times a customer had to be disconnected from the pipeline system and to ensure security of supply, the, uh, those customers were supplied via energy um, that were brought to them by trucks. So it is not new, but uh, it is being developed rapidly. 
um, and in a more um, diverse way, because energy can be, of course, um, brought to those customers by roads, but also by uh, waterways and more recently by railroads. Um, and there are, there are more and more examples of those projects being put on and being developed, bring, putting LNG on a train and send that to a customer. Um, if I'm uh, correct, uh, the very first case happened uh, in Zeebrugge last week or two weeks ago. Um, a word about virtual LNG. Um, and I also refer to Jose's uh, point on having access to liquid apps, uh, having bringing LNG to the terminal and having access to liquid apps with that LNG. This is uh, the other way around, in a way that um, it would be um, swapping energy tank with pipeline gas, and that would serve two purposes. One, of course, is to meet the energy request, energy regasification request. Uh, for uh, users of the terminal that would send their nomination and uh, those nominations would be met, um, but not physically, because the energy would remain in the tank. And of course, the small market, small scale market participants would in turn be in a position to have um, a priced um, pipeline gas being brought as LNG in the terminal and being used in um, the further development of their business. One uh, virtue of that type of um, um, service is that, as I said, um, it would enable small-scale energy participants to bring um, gas from liquid herbs at a market-based price. Um, slight slight um, disadvantage is, of course, uh, it would be um, interruptible uh, given the standard nomination. So it, you must have a nomination of energy leaving the terminal in order to be able to offer such a um, virtual liquefaction service if you want. But this is certainly a way uh, to um, enable the small scale business, the small scale energy business to further grow and develop um, whether on, in a regulated or in a non-regulated uh, terminal. Um, and then now I go back to the terminals in Europe. So if we have 29 regas terminals in the EU28. Yes, I do count um, the um, UK terminals in those figures. Um, we already have 16 terminals offering reloading services. Uh, we forgot to transshipments. We have two types of ship to ship transshipments. Uh, we have uh, we have two types of transshipments. Sorry, we have ship to ship transshipment services, um, but for that you need two jetties. Um, and for terminals who do not have two jetties, we have the ship tank ship transshipment that are offered in those terminals. We can find uh, 15 trucks loading installation um in terminals and small scale services are available in eight terminals if i compare with this uh with the situation um in 10 years ago that was certainly not the case so we see that this business is growing now back to the regulation um and in order to put that in perspective regulation was um a way to make sure that there was a kind of level playing field and that um, hoarding was not to be uh, taking place in the existing terminals. So most of the terminals in the EU are have a regulated third party access, as we all know, and five terminals, um, six counting Rovigo, have a um, negotiated access conditions. Um, one is hybrid regime, Porto Levente, 20% regulated, 80% uh, negotiated TPA, and three of them are not connected to transmission networks. When you look um, in terms of capacity, 62% of the capacity is subject to, and I'm referring to um, regasification capacity, subject to regulated TPA regime, 37 is exempted and only 1% is off grid. No, this is not, an, I'm not advocating uh, regular, uh, regulation as such. This is just uh, merely a um, situation, situation as we see today. No, the question arises, of course, um, about the regulation is, uh, is it still 
uh, the right way to uh, um, have the, mo the the model in Europe. And um, again, thank you, Jonathan Stern, for your views on that. Um, the existing energy infrastructures, the terminals, um, they do play a role in the development of small-scale energy, as I've said, uh, and they are mostly regulated. But there is a part of the small-scale energy business which is not regulated, which are the midstream or downstream projects, like the truck filling stations that are not regulated, like the, the bringing of energy toward the end users, this is not regulated. Um, so in, if you take the value chain of the small-scale energy, the regulated part is mainly the regas terminal, and this is for historical reason. So the question is, would still would it still need to be the case um, with regard to small scale, or with regard to virtual uh, LNG? Well, <clears throat> a way to see to look at it is not via the regulation, but via the markets, um, because we've seen that. Although they are operated under different regimes, different uh, energy terminals, um, and also, and even more, the small-scale energy project, they have been developed, the services um, with regard to the market needs. So there was a demand for those services, and the infrastructure owners um, re <clears throat> responded to that demand by offering the requested services, whether it's regulated or non-regulated. and. I think um, we need to stay aware of that. It's not a regulator who is driving the market, certainly not. It's the evolution of the market that drives this, the request for new services. And it's by developing those new, new services that operators um, fit the market needs. So um, the most important part of that slide is the yellow or orange question mark. What about the regulation of new services in energy terminals in Europe? Um, what we have seen is that, as I've said, the operators, uh, energy operators are adapting to the changing market conditions. They do that whether in regulated or exempted uh, regime. But to, we with regard to the regulated terminals, as regulators, we have to make sure that there is no barrier to the development of new services. So the new projects can be developed, even though for a regulated terminal, they can be developed via merchant approach, which is based on the customer needs. And I think I may say this is the case for Belgium, where the operator is developing the services um, because he's in contact with the market and the regulator is um, accompanying those developments by making sure this is um, done according to the regulation uh, on a non-discriminatory basis and so on and so on. In some cases, um, and I've already answered a question that's been put by the, by the attendees, um, there might be some regulatory regime changes to enable a more rapid um, reaction a more rapid development of new services in the in this rapidly changing um, LNG market, which, which, as a global market, we've seen we've seen the, the drastic change, as Rocio mentioned, uh, from a undersupply to Europe to a important supply to Europe, and with all the kind, all the different um, services that, that go along with that. So in some cases, yes, a change in uh, regime or in re regulatory regime might be advisable. In some cases, um, maybe not. So it uh, would vary from country to country or to from region to uh, region. In terms of um, comparing energy and pipeline gas, uh, we must ensure as a regulator that there is a level playing field for both sources of gas. And this is in particular the case with regard to virtual liquefaction. Um, and as long as there is no virtual energy in place in a terminal, there is no way a small scale energy player uh, may get gas other than from a current uh, capacity holder in that terminal or that capacity holder might uh, himself develop a small-scale energy business. 
but if you want to attract new small um, players, this is a way to um, give another access uh, to the gas um, that would then transform in energy. But that needs to be on a level playing field. Um, and as a result of that, uh, we need to move to a dynamic regulation and not being um, fixed in the model that we know in our respective countries. Um, and But we do need to remain independent and be pragmatic. Uh, what would kill the development of a business, being LNG or anything else, is the complexities. So we need to keep it, uh, we need to use the KISS principle and remain, well, stupid simple um, and certainly uh, we regard to small scale energy because of all these specificities. Um, the latest news for the few examples of those uh, new businesses that are currently being developed, uh, we've seen that Total and Pitpoint Energy have started the construction of a multiple energy truck station in the Netherlands. Um, in Belgium, um, Roland has uh, opened its first energy station. Uh, that's for road transport. Um, with regard to ship bunkering, uh, we have seen the development of the new small scale energy terminal in Sardinia, in Italy. Um, with no offense to people from Sardinia. Um, and uh, interesting development for the gas supply to end users again in Belgium is a energy that installs a station, an energy station in a farm for disabled adults uh, in order to bring LNG for two cogeneration units and uh, interesting development uh, possible in the, in the future would uh, to use uh, bioenergy of a biomethane production unit that is located not too far away from that from that location. But I'm sure that um, with all those uh, development in a decarbonized way or, or um, Arno uh, will uh, further expand on that. So this is, this is all I wanted to say uh, about the uh, regulation of energy and a few messages uh, as a way of conclusion because I see we're running out of time and uh, um, there's still some questions being put forward um, in the chat. So um, the energy market, as we all know, is a flexible one and it is rapidly evolving. Um, small scale energy developed in existing infrastructure as well as in new projects, mainly downstream. Um, and we need to go along with that. Um, but as I, again, the driving forces are market needs. It's not the regulation, certainly not. Uh, but if there is regulation for a specific infrastructure, it has to be dynamic and it has to be pragmatic so that the market can move forward. I thank you for your attention and I get back to you, uh, Agustin, now. I'll be happy to take questions. Yes, thank you very much, Yves. Okay, during the presentations, we have received many questions from the audience. Uh, let's try to go through all of them during the next minutes. So first question, I will address it, uh, I think is more suitable for you, Lucas. No, it's directly uh, for you. And the question is concerning the European Commission roadmap. Uh, will there be further consultation of stakeholders in the assessment? Uh, thank you, Agustin. Uh, so, for, so for now, we publish the study, and we are very happy to to take any views. And uh, everyone, you are all uh, very welcome to 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 contact us with your views about the study. Uh, for now, we are not foreseeing any formal um, consultations because. We are not yet formally launching any legislative process or so. But if at some point uh, the process would be launched, then of course that would uh, follow all the well known steps as uh, impact assessment, public consultations, etc. But for now it's, it's, um, it's not the case yet. So, but nevertheless, we are very happy to, to take any views. We are presenting this study on. Uh, various forums now it's a bit more difficult due to the situation but as today or so so please um, feel free and encourage to contact us with your views okay thank you lucas 
In this sense, uh, if uh, you said that the driving forces for new services like small scale uh, LNG services are market needs. So what do you think it could be the best or a suitable way to assess those market needs uh, through public consultation, through LSO's proposals? What do you think about this? Um, well, I, th I think the, 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 the request for new services would come from the market. Um, and as in any commercial business, as a customer or potential customer comes with a need for a specific service, then it's up to the uh, operator to develop that service, provided this is, this is profitable, of course. Um, so the, that's the normal, I would, say, I would say, business relationship between a customer and a, a, a service provider. What we need to do as a regulator is make sure it happens the right way. Um, so that um, all customers or potential customers are treated on a non-discriminatory uh, way and that the services are developed uh, accordingly. A consultation, um, um, it's, a, it's a possibility, uh, but I would rather concentrate on a normal uh, business relationship. That being said, um, of course, in the case of regulated terminal, it's important that uh, that's, it's all happens um, with the full knowledge of the regulator. So we need to be present uh, and to, to keep monitoring that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, I will address the questions to the speakers, but if any other speaker wants to give his opinion about a particular question, please uh, feel free. Rocio, now a couple of questions addressed to you. How to strike the right balance between needed flexibility for long-term users, essential for the market, and new entrant access? And I will join together with another question that could also be addressed to you in, in the sense that, okay, do you think a well-developed market like Northwest Europe is facing similar regulatory challenges as if you were speaking about them? Uh, thank you, Agustin. Um, well, on the question about flexibility, um, how we can deal with the needs for flexibility on the long-term uses and also make room for new uh, players uh, or, or for short-term cargos, for instance, uh, we have chosen to, to sell capacity on the long-term basis, so 15 years, for instance, in Spain, but not all the capacity, 90% of the capacity for the first two years and 50% for the next. So that means that in the short term, so monthly, uh, the technical system manager is going to be allocating also 10% uh, of the capacity, so some slots, and the remaining capacity for the uh, storage or for regasification, uh, bunkering, uh, small scale, so loading, um, loading trucks. Also, the flexibility, as I, I understand it, is being able to buy in the primary market the service you want. So, since we have been able to split services, uh, and because there is different profiles, more and more different profiles of users of the terminals, I think uh, a different offer of services together with different market needs, primary and secondary market both working uh, in uh, coordinately, I think is the answer to be able to make the most of the capacity of the terminals. That is the key for, for both the old users or the users. I think the question may, be, may come from someone with a vertical integrate company and final demand for consumers. So the thing is that we are making uh, the LNG terminal a bit more complex uh, in terms of access, but also we are developing new tools in the European market. So the gas hub and the, the, the price reference also and the, the hub, the place as a place to buy, to buy gas, I think it's a very good complement to all of this. So meaning that you can access uh, gas for your consumers, not only with LNG, but with the gas hub. Um, you can balance your portfolio, not only with LNG, like in the old days, but with also pipeline gas and gas coming from the hubs. And regarding if the Northwest uh, do have the same thing, I don't know if they are asking if the Northwest terminals are going to be 
looking for creating a virtual LG terminal. I don't know, really, <laughs> I'm on the Spanish regulator. No, 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 I, I haven't heard about that. Uh, I think Northwest ter Terminal has been doing uh, quite well. Some of them are booked on the long term, like uh, Thibruye or Elo Grain or South Hook. So I think secondary capacity market um, congestion management procedure plus transparency is, is the right question for, is the right answer in order to develop more flexibility, um, better uh, and service that suit better market needs. Uh, but I don't, I think particularly particular um, adaptations of the regulation is up to the to each market to developers. I, I don't think that we will need to have the same regulatory measures in every country because still uh, each national country has difference. I don't know if, if you want to add something or perhaps uh, Jose, since you operate in several terminals, uh, if, you, if you think that we can copy from each other. I things. think it is um, challenging, let's put it this way. Uh, because imagine, for example, uh, we, we are operating either in, in Spain and either in, in Isle of Grain. So we, we are quite familiar with both systems, the, the ones for exempted terminals, the one for uh, regulated terminals. As far as, for example, Isle of Grain, Northwest European accepting uh, terminals profile. So most of the shippers have uh, contracted for 20 years duration ship or pay obligations. So if uh, eventually uh, we are not using uh, any slot or whatsoever uh, in a quite a structural way, for example, in those years in which the market is short and uh, there is some better attractive market say, for the LNG elsewhere, um, it is quite difficult to conceive that there might be some small operator that would be willing to, to use the, the capacity because uh, if uh, we do not think that the market is paying for that, why should it be for other termina for other users? And this is something that historically has been repeatedly proved um, in terms of developing a virtual scheme, uh, for example, in UK, so we have uh, three exempted terminals, Isle of Grain, South Hook and Dragon. So it would be, to me, a bit uh, a paranoid exercise to try to get all the shippers that I'm, I'm paying on a long-term basis for the capacity and just uh, giving to someone else the, the right to optimize the utilization and say, well, you know, it would be just like uh, trying to score the, 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 the circle. So I think it is challenging, which is not meaning that uh, I am preferring this structure to the one in Spain, clearly. Huh? But I think it would be difficult to conceive, at least at this stage. Okay. So uh, I will continue with you, Jose. You said the. Um, that in the past it was essential to have uh, final customers to ensure the sales, but now it's enough to have regasification capacity due to the hub markets. So from a trading mm -hmm. point of view, what do you think about the possibility that also LNG hub markets develop in the future? I mean, uh, within LNG tanks and not only the transmission network, having even no need or less need to book regasification capacity. So trading directly the, in the LNG tanks. Well, I, I I think it's perfectly workable. Meanwhile, you are fulfilling some obvious requirements that may, may be, for example, having um, enough storage capacity, so a sufficient number of LNG tanks, uh, having abundant LNG supplies, obviously. And, and when you put these two pieces together with uh, appetite in the market and players that want to play around, I think it's something that is uh, fully workable. Definitely, if it is linked to a sufficiently developed uh, hub market, uh, it helps. It helps. But uh, for example, in Spain, uh, it, it is taking its first steps with the um, um, uh, MIP gas LNG market, and it's, I think it's proved to be workable. Definitely. So clearly, the, the, the European markets are a step ahead of all the other international markets and, uh, and the other international with us terminal schemes. So I, I think it's workable. Okay. Uh, Lucas, this is a question for you. LNG terminals are very specific. So that means bottlenecks could be at the jetty, the tank, or the send out capacity. So won't standardize mean a massive disoptimization? So, um... 
Yeah, indeed, that's uh, that um, quite pertinent comment. So, indeed, the a the terminals are very different from the pipelines interconnectors. So that's why what I said at the beginning, and I think, and that's definitely not not what is suggested in our study that we should completely I don't know mirror the provisions from uh, CAM network code to the to the LNG. So that's that's definitely not the not the suggestion. Uh, so that's that's the first difference. And a, of course, the terminals uh, are different uh, between each other and have a bit different role, as rightly said during this um, panel, in different countries, regions, etc. So that's um, that's a challenge. Of course, the, the the question would be: Is it possible to find? I mean, uh, based on the on the study results. Uh, is it possible to find a minimum level of harmonization in case of the capacity allocation uh, congestion management is it is it possible to find a minimum level of harmonization that would uh, have uh, positive impact and would be doable in uh, in all terminals i think that's the that's the open questions and um, the consultants Suggested uh, they they have some ideas and the the, um, the chapter on the capacity allocation is quite developed with the with the ideas of the length of products etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's worked out, but it's I would say it's it's a food for thought and it's it's an idea, but definitely it's uh, very important to keep these uh, specificities in mind if uh, if uh, ever uh, designing the some some uh, more harmonized rules in this respect. Okay, thank you, Lucas. Uh, there is also another question, maybe addressed to you or to both of you, you and it. Um, a working framework for bio LNG could be a priority to develop a small scale in Europe, in particular access to guarantees of origin and certificates. So I don't know if yeah. uh, you look at it. Yeah. yeah, I can start. So, but but that's uh, that's not connected to the study. But I can I can I can I can add to something. So as as I said, so the study did not look on this. Uh, let's say I, I called it decarbonization part of of uh, LNG or uh, ab uh, ability of LNG terminals to uh, to to import. Uh, renewable and low carbon um, gases uh, so we it did not assess that but definitely and what you what you see and what you know from the energy uh, system integration uh, strategy and uh, and hydrogen strategy the issues of um, of guarantee of certificates etc will be assessed and are let's say on our radar so the the the, the question is probably is it uh, is it um, is there any really lng specific um, challenge or do we rather need to see that horizontally on the uh, from the from the gas market or the carbonized gas market perspective in the future i, I would say rather we should Look on this broadly. Uh, I mean, from the from the regulatory perspective, of course. But indeed, that okay. uh, that uh, that's a big uh, big topic for uh, for for future or for near future, I would say. Okay. So in this sense, there is a comment also from the audience uh, saying that road users are already facing regulations requ requiring bio LNG incorporation by 2030 to respect the specific emissions that it will be the case soon for maritime transport uh, okay uh, also there's another question for you lucas um, is there an example at the national level of a country that comes closest to the level of transparency open market that is being advocated at european level yeah. So uh, just to 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 reflect on the comment on the bio LNG. Yeah, indeed, I, I'm not an expert on the on the transport and maritime regulation. So I was referring more on uh, uh, energy regulation and uh, certificates as such. But okay, thanks uh, thanks for this um, additional explanation. And on the country, yeah, I would say we did not go into the study, so the consultants did not assess any other country, etc. Saying. Uh, this is uh, good or bad. I think 
you have um, you have best practices uh, that could be um, let's say merged and gathered and so that that would be the one and in general i think uh, the let's say the good it's it's not directly transparency but it's connected so i think the good guidelines good, good guidance on the let's say maturity of the market or actually on the hub the um, the acer mmr report uh, provides with the with the uh, assessment of the advancement maturity of the of the gas hubs in the in the eu so i think that that um, that uh, that document gives uh, quite a good 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 guidance okay so thank you very much to all the panelists and the questions from the participants i will end here as we are running out of time um okay now is break time we will restart uh, in 15 minutes let's say and uh, 10 past uh, 12. thank you very much everyone okay thank you okay bye bye Thank you, goodbye.
Okay, I think it's time to resume. I don't know if Rocio and Eva are there. We're about to launch this uh, second session of the, uh, the webinar. Okay, so Rocio, I, I see you. So do you want to say a few words before we start or? I'm sure you're still muted. Yes. You're still on mute. Couldn't hear you. We can't hear you, uh, Rocio. I cannot. No, I cannot. Rocio, you're on mute. Technical issue, technical problem. Ah. Okay. Right. Okay. Maybe can we can we launch the, the this session? Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank uh, our three panelists. I will introduce you when 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 you you start your your speeches. Uh, just to say that now after this um, these discussions uh, this morning about uh, about the the dynamics of regulation and many aspects of the future role of gas, future role of LNG have been. Um, have been addressed, and in particular, the points about uh, use of LNG in the transportation sector, the uh, use of whether well, green LNG, and these topics have already slightly been addressed. I mean, it's uh, it's part of these big challenges we have ahead uh, of us, and and I take also from from the words of uh, uh, Jonathan Stern that we are really at at, the, at crossroads, and and we are about to experience big changes in in the uh, in the gas business in general and in the LNG business in particular uh, being about this this globalization this potential globalization of the uh, the gas market we saw uh, uh, all these uncertainties we we have nowadays and uh, uh, looking also to the future um, how the the role of LNG uh, is going to change or could change what are the new services and new business models that we could see uh, emerging in the uh, uh, in the LNG sector uh, so um, uh, I think that this session will be there to to give some sh some light on these uh, these challenges with the division the from the industry um, and and we're really happy to have uh, with three speakers uh, Mr. Arno Bux, uh, for which who is GLE uh, president and uh, representing then the uh, LNG terminal managers uh, uh, and operators, sorry, in Europe. So we're really looking forward to your thoughts about the role LNG can play in decarbonizing uh, the, the the energy sector in general and the gas sector in particular. Then we will move to Fabrizio uh, Buffa. Uh, from Iveco and with this focus on uh, LNG for, for transportation. Uh, so here, uh, another important element, and we could touch upon here about this discussion between centralized or decentralized LNG, uh, which is uh, also a critical point with this, this uh, question of having LNG filling stations all over the ter territories. And then uh, Sahira Ahmed, from Shell will elaborate on the uh, role of uh, well, the use of LNG for, for shipping, another aspect which is the direct use uh, of LNG uh, by, by, uh, by, by ships uh, for this maritime transportation. So I will stop here and give the floor to Mr. Bux. So the floor is yours, yours, and looking forward to your messages then. Thank you.
and I, rem I remind the, the participants that you can send via the, the, the chat some questions that will be asked afterwards during the Q&A session. So it seems that you're still muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for giving GLE um, the opportunity to uh, indeed give some messages and also, um, well, get some questions to, to you out there on the future role of LNG. Um, if somebody can swap the, sli uh, swap the slides, please, and move to the next one. So when we discuss about the future role of LNG, there is the need to uh, distinguish the role of LNG as we currently know it, i.e. liquefied methane of fossil origin, and the role that LNG infrastructure can play when potentially um, moving different forms of energy around. As for the uh, contribution that gas and also liquefied natural gas can uh, bring to the decarbonization strategy. I think it's well established by now, starting from the bottom. Of course, gas can uh, replace more polluting um, fuels, especially in the, um, in the power production, electricity production. Uh, it has the virtue of being storable easily and in large amounts at a very low costs. And when it is in its liquid form, it's a perfect uh, fuel for especially heavy transport, be it uh, on water or on the road or even on rails. Uh, but I guess that Sahira will uh, speak more in detail to that uh, contribution, so I leave that for the moment. Um, that is also being the main point on the next slide. Uh, again, the virtues that, uh, that natural gas in its liquefied form brings to um, helping to achieve the decarbonization targets, but definitely uh, being the solution of choice for um, reducing air pollution of heavy transport. Again, um, well established by now, challenged, rightly so, by the issue of methane slip. Uh, Jonathan Th uh, Stern has referred to it in his speech, uh, saying it is being fixed actually says two things. First of all, it is being addressed by the industry, also by, well, the OEMs that produce um, ship engines and, and truck engines, but it is being fixed. So it's fair to say that it is not yet fixed. And it's definitely one of the main technolo technological challenges we have to address in the next year uh, to be able then hopefully in a few years to say it has been fixed. Um, on the next slide, please. Um, a focus on um, bio LNG uh, or gas from biological sources that could be liquefied. Um, definitely a topic of growing importance. It is also part of um, uh, the European Commission's strategy to attain the net zero target um, in a certain, uh, with a certain volume, with a certain potential. Um, here from EIA, a reminder of the actual production of biofuels uh, versus the potential that there is out that that is uh, out there and that is far from being tapped into uh, these days. Eva has also. Um, highlighted the fact that existing LNG infrastructure can have a critical role in putting bio LNG at the use in much more um, circumstances and much more sectors that it is being done today. Um, because indeed, um, the sources of actual biogas being liquefied at the, um, um, at the point of its production is of course very low. Uh, but using the right schemes of certificates of origin, we can bring um, produced biomethane um, at use in its liquefied form by actually virtually swapping that uh, gas um, that is in pipes with um, LNG that is being um, stored and, 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 and then distributed in small scale uh, from the existing terminals. So definitely a potential uh, for a much broader development of bio LNG, especially uh, in the application of the mobility sector. Here we will need some um, regulatory support, but um, I may come back to that later. Now on the next slide, I will pause for a few minutes because this is actually um, quite, quite important. Uh, and this is 
well, actually my main message today. So um, GLE has been mandated by the Madrid Forum to take a closer look at to what extent um, the terminals are ready today to receive hydrogen. Uh, and so to make import of hydrogen one of the means of Europe to attain the net zero targets. When you look closer into that, um, it becomes apparent quite quickly um, that one needs, needs to look at the potential of LNG infrastructure in this context from different angles. Yes, of course, hydrogen in its liquid form or other forms is one of the possible pathways, one of the options in which um, LNG infrastructure can continue to use to play a role as, as entry gates to the European energy markets and actually help to accelerate in achieving that goal. But there are other pathways. And uh, when you look at the sheer amount of energy that will need to be um, put to use in the form of molecules, green molecules, um, decarbonized molecules, molecules, we need all the options. Um, we need to put all the options at use in order to get there. So what are the options? Um, and the framework that, that, that we created on which the rest of the presentation will, will be structured upon is the following. So we have the existing infrastructure. And this infrastructure can be used to import decarbonized methane from sources, from biological sources or from synthetical forces. Just think of the combination of CO2 and hydrogen. In doing so, of course, we do not spend any money whatsoever, no money whatsoever on changing existing technical infrastructure. We can just put them to use. Um, and to the extent that those sources are being developed outside of the EU, um, progressively decarbonize the existing methane transport and distribution system. At the previous slide, we took a look at the potential of bio LNG that is out there. So this potential is important. Um, the main challenge here is not technological. It is not money because the infrastructure is existing. The main challenge here is to have the software ready. That, it, that means the, the legal and paralegal rules, um, certificates, quality, definitions, etc., that will allow to, um, well, to avoid misuse of those certificates and to have a proper um, decarbonized and sustainable source of bio LNG and synthetic LNG put to use to, the, to Europe. The second pathway is to continue to import standard LNG, um, that is methane also of fossil origin, and to decarbonize that methane downstream after the import. Um, and several technological options exist. Um, steam, methane reforming, of course, as today's technology, go-to technology. Pyrolysis uh, is more and more um, entering into the scope. It has um, fundamental, i.e. energetic advantages over uh, electrolysis and also methane reforming. It has also the advantage that uh, it sort of solves the um, the return issue of CO2 because uh, the carbon is being um, produced in a easy to handle form um, of black carbon. Uh, it still has uh, technological challenges um, to be solved, uh, but so have most of the solutions that are being put on the table when we think about 2050. And um, quite frankly, when I hear big chemical or petrochemical companies being very secretive about um, the progress they have made in making paralysis, um, in make, bringing it to industrial maturity, um, I personally think that there is something to it. The most encouraging message that, that we have received is top secret, don't bother, we're bringing it to the market. So I think that we are onto something here. The third pathway um, is then other options of um, importing hydrogen either pure and liquefied form or other forms. And we will come back to the different options that we have here. Here, the number of technological challenges is, is, is important. Um, we mostly continue to evolve in a cryogenic environment, but go to temperatures that are close to the absolute zero. So you can imagine the, uh, the technological challenges that come with it, and hence also the amount of money that still needs to be thrown both in um, R&D 
but also in updating or creating new infrastructure to handle this. Um, there is no one answer to those different sub options, so we will come back to them later. And the fourth one to be complete is e-fuels. E-fuels are also an important part of the European hydrogen um, strategy. Um, they evolve today because this is already an existing actually value chain uh, that is being run by large petrol, chemical or chemical rather uh, companies. Uh, so this is totally outside of, um, I would say, uh, the scope of what SARE usually does. Um, but still, it addresses the same market and the same needs. Uh, but is outside of all energy or infrastructure related um, uh, well, business model and hence regulation. So um, still, it, it, it will compete one against each other. So to have all of those on one table, I think is very important. Uh, GLE has commissioned two studies to address this, 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 well, this pathway uh, conundrum, um, a more regulatory oriented um, with frontier economics, and those are the outcomes that I will discuss later, uh, and also a technical and cost perspective with DMVGL that uh, we will not address today. Um, those will be, you know, the result of both will be presented um, to the Madrid Forum uh, later on this year. Next slide, please. So we'll go now, we will go now through the four pathways. The first one being um, to, um, to import already decarbonized um, um, methane or methane that is, that is from, um, uh, from carbon-free sources. So there is not really a lot to say uh, because the infrastructure is existing. As I said, uh, no technological challenge. Um, the challenge is in running on an international basis, a system of guarantees of origin to, to control, to check upon the quality where this is coming from. Um, we now, the world community has experience in this in other fields. It is not a simple one, uh, but on the other side, the potential also to have value created in, in, in countries that, that, that use, um, sorry, that need additional value creation or to, to get ahead um, is also very important. So this is also in terms of, I would say, trade partnership and uh, development aid, um, a very promising and a very important pathway, but no real energy specific policy required. Um, and the role of LNG terminals, it's quite straightforward because it doesn't change. We just continue uh, to, to work uh, and um, can bring up to the total de uh, de demand of Europe, um, of European gas to, um, to Europe in mobilizing all um, the, the global potential that we have. On the next slide. The second pathway that is the, um, the, car, the decarbonization of uh, methane downstream, so after the terminals. Now, one could argue, well, same thing. We continue to import uh, methane, so no change, no technological change and no regulatory change. Um, the second is true. On the first one, however, um, let us all remind of the fact that um, when decarbonizing methane um, and when using the technology of, of steam methane reforming or of electroly electroly electrolysis, sorry, um, we will have large amounts of CO2 to handle. And um, to the extent that they are being shipped off for CCS, um, there is synergy to develop around existing terminals in the sense that CO2 will be shipped off uh, in the proper sense of the word, so by ships. Um, and um, terminals typically are also located in harbors and close to um, large petrochemical clusters. Uh, and when you stroll around the different pilot projects around Europe um, that, have, that, that deal with CO2 uh, pooling and, and exporting, um, well, they typically are around large ports, so in the proximity of, uh, of terminals and also the use of waste coal that has been mentioned by a um, participant earlier on is just one example of industrial um, and industrial cluster synergies that can be created around the role of LNG, uh, around LNG terminals uh, for this future um, um, role. Um, we can also think of uh, terminals being an entry and decarbonization gate for methane into Europe and consider them as a sort of um, uh, an offshore free trade um, CO2 handling um, industry um, because we will be thinking about CO2 import taxes or other levies 
uh, that will be applied um, to gases once we know their overall um, greenhouse gas footprint, as Professor Stern hinted towards. And then terminals can here play a larger industrial role in transforming that methane um, before the gas or the hydrogen then actually enters into the system. Um, so here are some, I would say, here's a call for clever regulatory uh, amendments around this role in the future. The third pathway on the next slide is then the Champions League um, from many perspectives. Let's start with the technological ones. Um, so several options to import hydrogen in different forms. We have the liquid hydrogen solution that Japan has developed as a pilot. Um, we have liquid organic hydrogen carriers where molecules are used to capture hydrogen. Um, molecules that can be handled more easily than liquid hydrogen to bring then this hydrogen um, on their back, so to speak, um, uh, to a terminal where um, the hydrogen is separated from its carrier and then that carrier has to be shipped back to the place of origin to then be rehydrogenated. Re -hydrogenated. Uh, so a very complex um, chemical and also logistical uh, task uh, we have synthetic LNG that is being um, sort of he bring, brought in here again. It's, it's the same synthetic methane we mentioned earlier on, but you can, of course, consider uh, it as, an, as, an, um, as part of the pathway three as well. And then you have ammonia, um, no carbon attached. Um, so very interesting from a pure carbon perspective, but as we all know, highly toxic and not easy to handle at all. Um, given the lack of maturity that we have in some of those technologies and giving uh, and, and also looking at the, the new industrial tools and also logistic chains that have been developed in, in order to, to get to that stage, we definitely speak here about a long-term potential solution. So uh, I would argue after 35, um, where significant investments have to be made and definitely for this one, at least for the last three ones to the right hand side, um, I would underline what Professor Stern said, saying that the existing regulatory framework is not fit for purpose for these sort of um, for, for, um, applications, putting the synthetic methane out, obviously. When it comes to hydrogen, we have all read in the um, uh, strategy, the hydrogen strategy from the commission that having a third party access model for hydrogen pipelines is the way to go, not in the first step, but in the second step. And then we sort of fall back onto a, a question that, that is very, I would say, common to all of us is um, if we have terminals feeding into, or in this case, um, um, hydrogen producing units feeding into a regulated grid, what is the regulatory status of these transforming um, steps of the value chain? Are they being considered as such, as a transformation of a integrated value chain, or are they being considered as a production unit in a regulatory uh, sense of the word? Um, we strongly believe that the first one is the right approach, at least in the first step, uh, because the uh, because if, if you consider all of those being different steps in a value chain where the uh, profitability has to be given in every single step in order for the whole chain to work, um, given the, the, the lack of maturity we have, it's never going to fly. Um, so we should look at this as an integrated value chain and then the role of the different existing industrial tools becomes quite obvious. There's a question that is raised very often in this context and it's how much does it cost to transform an LNG terminal into a liquid hydrogen terminal? Um, the answers that are out there are very approximative and not really reliable. Every company is doing its own exercise on its existing um, assets and uh, the range of answers can be very broad. But what is definitely true is that the real challenge when it comes to hydrogen is not infrastructure. It is the production of the hydrogen. That's where the value gap is and that's the first problem to solve um, and then the rest will follow with time and appropriate regulatory environments. The fourth pathway on the next slide is then, well, very simple because it's existing, um, but it is existing, as I said, in very narrow industrial uh, niches. That's uh, <laughs> a value chain that is very important to uh, chemical companies. Um, and then the fundamental question is, um, if this would 
have the, the call to become the backbone of the European energy uh, supply, would one want to leave that in the hands of that industry? Or would there be a need to, uh, to make sure that there, everyone has access to this um, forms of energy in an appropriate way? It's not necessary to regulate those. Just look at the way that heavy hydrocarbons are being you know, sold today in competition of vertically integrated value chains. Um, so this would be out of scope of GIE and also SARE, I guess. Um, and um, we would leave um, others uh, to, to run this value chains in competition with each other. And that is it basically, because on the next slide, um, I'm just thanking you for your attention. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are quite some questions with regards to this because this is very conceptual. Um, it, is, it is new, it is high level. So also to us, a lot of questions pop up on how this could possibly work. And I'll do my very best in trying to, to answer those. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this, this uh, very clear presentation, providing uh, so this, this long-term vision. And, and I guess we'll be back to that in the Q&A session on your comments on regulation. And, and it's true that uh, what you described opens to completely different uh, value chains and a new organization of the industry which which uh, would deserve probably uh, some further reflection about the appropriate uh, format for for bringing this to to happen i think it's really part of the debates that are developing nowadays uh, in europe so i jump uh, to the second speaker uh, so fabrizio from uh, from iveco uh, so uh, i leave you the the microphone to to Tell us about uh, about uh, LNG in the road transportation. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, today, I would like to talk to you about uh, what is the um, effort of uh, an OEM company that is developing and investing in uh, um, truck industry. And now is approaching the theme of uh, uh, the zero transport emission. We talked about the um, until today, until now, the LNG demand and offer and the, and the COVID situation that affected also the, the demand and the offer, the regulatory framework and then also the emissions that can be abated using the LNG. Now, the, the, the focus will be in the next five, 15 minutes, uh, the idea and the uh, aims of uh, um, NOM manufacturer. So, um, just a few words. The Beco is a global manufacturer of light, medium, and heavy commercial vehicles. Uh, we decided to um, put the effort on a, a wide range, a complete range of vehicles that can be also can can run also on um, on gas and biogas. Why? Because we we needed to give an answer to the facts of uh, um, emissions uh, and uh, noises and, and also uh, the economical sustainability uh, right now. So we know that focus is the CO2. We know that uh, we have a long way uh, on, our, on our steps, but we needed to give an answer now. So the idea is this, um, give the possibility to the, customer, to the customers to have a choice between the um, traditional propulsion, or, or meaning uh, diesel engines, and other kind of alternative propulsions that in this moment, talking about commercial and industrial vehicles, can only mean uh, natural gas. Uh, the, the range is complete that goes from the daily, so that the, the traditional one from 3.5 tons up to the long goal applications with the new US way, and also the light extraction segment, that is the new segment that is also approaching to the natural gas uh, sector, the, demonstrating the the absolutely reliability of the of that fuel for the for the commercial industrial vehicles. Um, we talked about also uh, hydrogen and new technologies. Of course, we are approaching also the new technologies uh, 
that are uh, in our cases uh, electric vehicles on one side and hydrogen vehicles on the other side. Uh, for the electric and hybrid vehicles, we are developing uh, the so-called last mile and the passenger truck routes. So the last mile delivery with the daily electric that you see on the right and the passenger cars with the buses with the urban or regional buses. For the um, long haul application, there is also other technology. There are also other technologies to come that are electric and hydrogen. But I, I totally agree with uh, with you uh, when uh, it's been said that uh, the 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 biggest challenge that hydrogen uh, has is the production. I mean, uh, we need to produce the hydrogen in the most efficient way that could also come from the from the steam reforming from the natural gas, could also come from the electrolysis. But the, the main item is uh, how to efficiently produce the hydrogen. Uh, we won't talk about the hydrogen, we will focus the discussion on the, um, on the natural gas. Uh, the idea of uh, developing the products uh, in our mind when we design the products we have also always in mind some cases that are the, the, the aim to preserve the air quality talking about cities so when trucks for deliveries goes to the city and we, and we, we notice it in the last year, a big increase, maybe the biggest increase that we noticed in the last years for the last mile deliveries due to the uh, e-commerce growth, maybe due, surely due to the COVID situation. So air quality uh, regarding the particular matter, for example, in the uh, cities is one of the ma our main goals when we develop the new products. Also reduces greenhouse gas emissions because uh, um, uh, there are some studies that say that uh, in all the sectors, uh, the greenhouse gases during the uh, the time, it's also CO2 for as a main factor, um, decreased uh, in the last years. The only sector in which the greenhouse gases and the CO2 has increased is the transport sector. Is it? because we are not so efficient in doing vehicles, so, I mean, the, the industry. Yeah, maybe maybe this is not the answer. The answer, the answer is that the demand for transport is increasing a lot. So uh, the fact is that uh, we are part of the problem in that case, and we want to be part of the solution. So giving some uh, solutions, some uh, news in terms of uh, alternative propulsion. We don't need to forget also that noise reduction is a, an important theme when we approach the sustainability. And uh, natural gas vehicles, so being our vehicles based on uh, um, uh, egg cycles, so um, well, let's say petrol engines, and with that technology, uh, we reach uh, levels of noise that are much lower than the diesel. So it's also an important part of this. And lastly, but it's very important, uh, the aim must be also to preserve transporters' profitability in the terms of uh, uh, we need to guarantee also the economical sustainability because it's the first ability factor that keeps also the uh, environmental sustainability. Without the economical sustainability, we won't have any customer approaching that uh, that sector, that segment, the alternative propulsion, because otherwise it, it couldn't go ahead in his, uh, in his business. Uh, actually, uh, we focus on the uh, LNG and CNG, uh, as I said, because it is a ready, already ready technology and a reliable technology. So it's a long story, actually, because it started in 1996 for our uh, uh, industry. And um, up to today, we have sold more than 35,000 units uh, from uh, the light range to the medium to the heavy buses and engines included. 
Um, just to give you an idea of the sector, why is it important the natural gas for the uh, for the transport sector? We um, we are seeing increases uh, year after year uh, of a, a very good trend that can be almost exponential. Um, we have sold in the last five years uh, approximately 10, more than 10,000 units, uh, both CNG and LNG, of which more than 70% are LNG. Main uh, markets for the LNG trucks are Italy, France, Spain and Germany led by Italy and France, but we we have seen some changes also in the on the, in the industry because if we take the same analysis, but for the past 18 months, one and a half year, we see that Germany is booming as a market. And we see that uh, um, there are also other emerging markets that are that are um, approaching the theme. So we're talking about Poland, Balkans, Russia, and Argentina that are also approaching the um, the theme of, of uh, using the natural gas on the road transport. This analysis. Uh, if we see the biggest increase in the markets, we see uh, that is led by Germany, mainly due to the fact that uh, the, the German government uh, has approved the extensions of the amount exemption for the LNG trucks uh, until uh, end of December 2023. This gave a, 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 a boost of the market and of the market of the demand, because it means uh, a, an important saving for for transport and to, to use the the LNG trucks. Um, we can say that LNG have a lot of uh, advantages in the road transport. So first of all, the fuel price. When the customers, when the transporters approaches the, 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 the new, this new technology, um, immediately notice that uh, the, the fuel price at pump, so the diesel compared to the natural gas, is, uh, is something that is uh, uh, much convenient for him to buy LNG, for example. So this is the first key, the, the first enabling key. Then we have, uh, uh, today we can say we, we are starting having a developed filling station network. It means that when we started with the LNG that was actually 2012 approximately, we had very few stations around Europe and the situation was, uh, was a little was a bit complicated so um because uh, customers that they wanted to approach the 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 lng uh, didn't have enough refilling stations to complete their transports so it was something that was was the wasn't the enabling factor for development of the the sessions but now the situation is changing that i will show you later on then we have the the TCO with monthly operation, operational costs, and we will go in this also, subsidies of uh, um, governments uh, that are um, given, uh, given to the customers that are willing to buy the vehicles, or for example, subsidies related to the usage of the vehicles, so the exemptions, for example, the amount that I talked to you uh, a few minutes ago, and then we have the theme of sustainability in general. So going through the stations, I said in 2012 there were very few stations, but if we see the evolution, this chart is talking by itself because we see that from 50 stations in 2015 uh, we reached the uh, 314 stations today. LNG stations, talking about LNG stations, that are covering most of the Western Europe countries. There is still a need of developing in the infrastructures for corridors going through the Eastern Europe to the Russia, to Turkey, and all the countries, Balkans, for example. So there is still a need of, uh, of developing 
of the infrastructures, while Western Europe is uh, almost well covered. Um, for the evolutions, there are also good premises. It means that uh, uh, the, the forecast is to close the 2021 with 450 stations. So that is something very reliable considering the, the projects that are uh, already ongoing. There are uh, 14 with the end of 2020 and the end of 2021. So it's very re realistic, this number, that we'll see um, an increase in all European countries. Regarding the TCO, what I said as a TCO, um, and is uh, connected to the fact that I was saying that, that there must be an economical sustainability. When we approached to meet, and I, I decided to, to do an analysis to distinguish the fossil methane and the biomethane. Why? Because the biomethane, um, as prices of today of the fossil, is uh, a little bit more expensive at pump than the fossil methane. So this, uh, of course, uh, uh, influences and changes the, the TCO cases. But any, in any way, uh, it is true that uh, the truck has a higher initial cost, so has a higher financial cost, has a, a list low, higher cost in maintenance and repair because the technology is different, it's not diesel, it's a petrol engine. But at the end of the day, you have a saving that is approximately from 10 to 15 percent per month starting from the first month because you you pay an installment every month but you pay less for the fuel at pump you have less fuel consumption and so at the end of the month you always have a saving so you start saving money from the first month with a with a with the LNG trucks. Also with the biomethane, so the saving is, uh, um, is lower, but you still have a saving. This is very important because you have the economical sustainability, you have an impact of um, environmental sustainability, so in terms of CO2, NOx, NO2 and uh, NPM, and customers can benefit of the choices because they have uh, much more shippers to approach in their business, uh, offering them uh, some kind of value. So they don't need, they don't need to base the deal only on the um, price per kilometer, for example, but they can also offer a, a added value to their, to their proposal. So they can, say okay i can offer you a transport at that price but i can also guarantee you a saving in the co2 for your transport for the transport of your goods this is very important for example in the um in the food industry but um, let's say for some names for example are um uh, Lido or ikea or um carrefour there are a lot of names that are uh, oh, big industry players that are focused on that uh, uh, on this important uh, point. Why sustainability is so important, uh, and why um, we are trying to focus on the methane, but uh, we need to take the focus also on the biomethane. It is true that uh, we need to uh, compare our emissions uh, thanks to wheels, so the fact that the use of, of the fuel, um, the trucks that we need to compare are the diesel and the uh, LNG trucks uh, compared also to the new technologies that, that will come in the future that, that are electric and hydrogen. Um, at this proposal, I want to uh, say something that is, in my opinion, um, those new technologies, it means electric and hydrogen, will not substitute the, the LNG trucks, but they will be combined in a sort of uh, 
uh, additional offer portfolio. It means that uh, in the next 10 years, in 10 years, we will have a, a, a portfolio of uh, um, alternative tractions to offer to the customers that will be that will be comprehensive of, of electric hydrogen and methane with the biomethane probably. Why biomethane? Because we need to consider that we have a saving in terms of CO2 in tanks to wheel emissions uh, when we compare the um, diesel trucks with the LNG trucks. But when we compare the situation in well to wheel emissions, so considering also the production and distribution of the fuel, we have an impressive saving that of the CO2 that is around 95%. It means that today we can have a zero transport with a biomethane already available. The point is that with the electric and with the hydrogen today in well to wheel emissions, we cannot reach that kind of uh, CO2 saving because the production of the electricity and also the production of the hydrogen, the mix of the production is coming, is not 100% renewable, so it's coming also from fossils. So the combination of the fossil and the, and the renewable energy to produce the energy to produce the hydrogen, it's something that we must look at because uh, it won't give the zero transport and zero emissions in the world to wheel emissions considerations. Fabrizio, uh, I, I think that time is running, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. Could you give a, a few words of conclusion before we give the, the, the microphone to uh, the next yeah, speaker? Absolutely. absolutely. The focus in the, in the last part was the focus on the biomethane because, as I said, 95% of production that can be also higher if waste is reused after the process of reusing the biomethane as a fertilizer. So, so this is important. And also, the other last focus is that uh, we could also have the fuel supply independency. So uh, with the biomethane, we could produce the methane, uh, we can have a zero miles production. It means that we don't need to emit pollutants when we transport the fuel because we produce it locally and uh, it also a 100% channeling system so it's something that is very 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 important in, in that cases okay so yeah uh, i said the, the reduction of the the emissions uh, and actually that's it there are other cases in which transporters are already using the biomethane to do their transport sector this is the conclusion and just to to summarize some points thank you no oh, yeah thank you very much i think i get a few messages from what you say the first thing is having a network of filling station is really uh, the current challenge and it's developing in the right way uh, biogas is for sure an element to, to promote and and one of the important drivers in your sector is the price competitiveness of the fuel and, and we, we see that clearly the keeping competitiveness is, is absolutely uh, critical uh, thank you again and maybe should we move to uh, Sahira Hamad uh, for, for, for your presentation on, on the um, uh, maritime uh, transport so uh, Sahira you have a long-standing experience um, of LNG especially uh, in the A, let's say the Pacific Basin. Happy to share uh, your experience and views on, on this topic. So please uh, thank try you to, very to, much, to, Benoit. To keep um, your speech to 15 minutes. Thank you. Yes, I will do that. Thank you, Benoit. How are you doing? Um, hi, everyone. So we're all waiting for um, the slides to load because uh, I don't think I um, it's showing. Okay, now it's showing. Um, I am super excited. Um, Hang on. I'm super excited to uh, to be here today to share uh, thoughts on how uh, LNG can really decarbonize the maritime sector. Uh, the challenge is not an easy one, quite frankly, um, but the industry is really uh, keen to see this happen. Uh, Shell recently, together with Deloitte, uh, produced a report, which is basically a culmination of the survey that we've done 
uh, checking with the industry players on decarbonisation. And the survey essentially uh, echo what we've been thinking, that uh, the challenge is big and we need to uh, do something today. Um, so when it comes to shipping, um, as some of you might already know, 80% of the world trade in goods are being done by ships. And this is expected to increase by um, around 50% between now and 2030, not long. And as this happens, emissions will also grow. Um, IMO forecasts that emissions will increase um, anywhere between 50% to 250% by 2050. Um, so without any action, uh, the sector will be responsible for just under 20% of the global CO2 emissions, so very big numbers. Um, to address this challenge and this issue, we require multiple solutions um, to essentially halve uh, the emissions by 2050. But there is no silver bullet. We need to act now uh, to make the transition to a cleaner burning fuel. Uh, from, from Shell's point of view, um, LNG can play a, a key and fundamental role in providing a cleaner supply chain uh, for the billions of goods that is shipped around the world. Um, LNG, um, as, as we all know, is available in a meaningful volume and, and is the cleanest and the most affordable alternative to the traditional marine fuel. I will speak more about affordability in, in the subsequent slides. Um, LNG allows the maritime sector to start reducing greenhouse gas emissions substantially right from this point, uh, while we develop other low carbon fuel and other net zero emission fuel. Um, at the current point or at this current moment, other alternatives are very, very expensive. They are not currently available at scale, um, mostly are being done under a pilot or demonstration environment. Uh, and they're not ready. Essentially, they're not sufficient to address uh, the decarbonization ch challenge that uh, the maritime uh, sector is currently facing. Um, IMO has made a significant progress in agreeing to limit uh, sulfur and nitrogen oxides emissions from ships. Uh, for those of you who are in shipping, you've heard uh, how the industry was scrambling uh, to get this sorted at the start of 2020. Um, the nice thing is LNG fuel can actually help ship operators meet these requirements. Uh, compared to um, fuel oil, the conventional fuel oil that is used in shipping, uh, LNG virtually emits no sulfur oxides and 80% less nitrogen oxides. Uh, in ships when uh, it is used as fuel. Uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, for example, uh, Tingstep produced a report which was peer reviewed uh, and they found that um, by switching to LNG from heavy fuel oil, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, is reduced by 21%. Um, and these figures, of course, depend on the type of engines that you use. Uh, if you use four-stroke uh, engines, for example, then it's 16%. Um, and the reduction can actually be even higher. Uh, the previous speakers have talked about uh, the availability of bio-LNG, synthetic LNG. Uh, so as we mature the supply chain, uh, you will see that the greenhouse gas emission uh, is, is, is much more significant. Um, Shell is investing heavily on this, particularly in Europe, and um, as you may know, uh, Shell is not alone uh, in trying to mature the bio and the uh, synthetic uh, LNG supply chain. But the, the reality is the organizers have asked me to, to talk about uh, the pros and cons a bit. So it, it, it would be shameful if I, if I don't talk about the criticisms that uh, LNG face as, as a fuel. So we are going to talk about it uh, today. Um, the ICCT report um, that came out early this year, it points to the issue of methane slip in engine. Methane slip is essentially um, the inefficient is, is basically a phenomenon that in, uh, exists in internal combustion engine due to an inefficient uh, burning of uh, of the fuel. 
Uh, and the other one, the other point that was mentioned in the ICCT report is uh, methane fugitive, or basically methane leakage that arise uh, from the upstream production of natural gas. Um, and of course, the final uh, criticism is the fact that LNG is a fossil fuel, and that is an attribute that we cannot dispute. Um, so let me first address um, the point about LNG being a fossil fuel. And of course, today we talk quite a lot about bio. Um, so if you think about pathways, and uh, Arco presented just now as well about the pathway to make LNG a net zero emission fuel, uh, with the increase in production of bio and synthetic LNG, um, this, this can be achieved uh, very easily. And the key point to note here is that um, bio LNG, synthetic LNG is basically a drop fuel, a drop in fuel, uh, which essentially means that it can be transported, it can be stored, it can be bunkered in ports that is already um, uh, designed or already have in place operational with uh, existing LNG infrastructures. So to make LNG uh, zero emission fuel, it's not that difficult. It is indeed a fossil fuel, um, but there's a lot of activities being undertaken by uh, experienced industry players uh, to increase um, the credential of LNG in terms of um, emissions. With regards to meat and slip, um, again, uh, it is an issue. It is all about engine design. Uh, but really, there are choices today that uh, sheep owners, um, shippers can actually make. Uh, there are engine that is commercially available out there uh, that can um, that the meat and slip uh, number is super low. It's somewhere between 0.2 to 0.3 grams per kilowatt hours. And MAN, for example, this is one of the leading uh, manufacturers of engine in the maritime sector, is willing to even um, guarantee the performance of its engine in terms of uh, methane emission. So, so there are choices um, uh, available um, out there in trying to manage methane slip in internal combustion engine. Um, and the big criticism, especially for oil and gas producers, is, as I mentioned earlier, this leakage of methane in upstream production. Um, again, um, the industry is filled with very smart people. Um, Shell and has announced, together with uh, other major players in the industry, uh, to reduce the upstream, upstream methane emission uh, to below 0.2%. Uh, from the average of circa 1% uh, that currently exists from um, the different production locations that we currently have. Um, so this is, this is, the industry is making progress. Uh, so there's no real excuse uh, to just wait around and do nothing while we get this silver bullet fuel uh, that is uh, completely um, emission free. The other point uh, to, to mention here in terms of a blocker uh, for adoption of LNG as marine fuel is costs. Uh, and this is a critical point. Um, the shipping industry is extremely cost sensitive and generally up until recently is very, very um, weak fiscally. Um, the good news is cost is coming down rapidly. Um, our own uh, shipping and maritime unit has been studying how uh, we can reduce the incremental capex that is involved when uh, ship owners look at installing uh, dual fuel or LNG burning capability in their ships. Uh, in less than two years, uh, we've shown how capex can um, be reduced by um, close to 50% of the target that is set. At the start of the study period, the capex figures was around uh, 30 million. This is the incremental capex. And then and now we are at 7.6 uh, million thereabout. And this is all possible uh, because we understand better the data, we make improvements to the engine room uh, configuration, and also um, innovation. Um, and innovation here means, for example, uh, just operating uh, LNG um, on the main engine, uh, reducing the number of uh, auxiliary engine from um, 
three to two and just burning uh, oil and installing a shaft generator. So, so there's a lot of innovation uh, that has gone into uh, to make sure that we can deliver this capex reduction. Um, and the NVGL also has done some studies and uh, to look at the competitiveness um, as LNG, uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, the players need to be able to afford this uh, to sustain their business. Uh, when they look at ultra-large container vessels, um, the largest one being 23,000 uh, TEUs, uh, that's the unit of measure of size in the container business. Uh, the study shows essentially that over 25 years time horizon, um, LNG is the lowest cost. So you take into account the incremental capex and then you take into account uh, the opex, which basically comes from fuel savings. Um, so this essentially means that uh, when and when also the payback period is much is is well within the useful life of the vessel, it essentially means that the investment is have very little risk of it being stranded. Um, because this is always a concern for ship owner. You invest on a ship, and then after X number of years, the sh ship still can operate, uh, but because of changes in uh, economic conditions, the ship becomes stranded. Um, so the risk of ships being stranded uh, when uh, ship owners invest in um, LNG uh, is, is very low. Um, and in fact, some uh, engine manufacturers are already looking at ways and doing quite advanced studies to show how uh, the LNG engine, the fuel gas system, the cryogenic uh, systems that you install can be used uh, for other fuels, including hydrogen. Let me move to the next slide. Does it seem to be working? Give me a moment. Yeah, um, and the nice thing about LNG is uh, it has you know more than 40 years of track record. Um, so when it comes to availability, um, LNG is um, available. Uh, it's being loaded, unloaded at 150 ports around the world, um, making LNG available as marine fuel is essentially about adding the last mile of the supply chain investment. If you think about a supply chain. LNG bunkering um, is, is very simple and, and, and easy. Uh, Shell uh, itself is planning to have LNG available in uh, 15 uh, ports uh, that exist around uh, the major trading routes by mid-2020s, basically in the next uh, three to five years. And Shell is not alone in this. Um, there are other producers, Total for one, that is also looking at expanding uh, the LNG bunkering footprint alongside other niche players. Um, most of them are European who are looking at expanding um, the LNG bunker vessel um, um, footprint. Uh, so there is really no issue about availability uh, when it comes to adopting LNG as marine fuel. Uh, soon, marine LNG will have the look and feel of conventional marine fuel, whereby a ship just rocks up and be able to get uh, access to, to fuel. Another slide. So, um, so in, um, in summary, um, LNG is, is really well placed to play a key role in the multi-fuel future uh, for the maritime sector. Uh, it can immediately drive decarbonization uh, that is required uh, today uh, and is a no regret investment uh, given that it actually provides very clear uh, and realistic pathways towards uh, zero emission fuel. Uh, Shell is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is expanding its LNG bunkering footprint uh, while keeping very close eye on our safety track record. Uh, we need this. This is our license to operate. Um, Europe is our backyard. We've achieved many first here. Um, you know, the first uh, tanker vessel uh, was bunkered in the Port Rotterdam, uh, first cruise ship, and we've also done um, the first uh, simultaneous operations, which is very important because time is key uh, in Europe. Um, the figures you see on your screen right now 
uh, is a bit outdated actually uh, in terms of uh, CMOPs or simultaneous operations. We've done more than 150 to date, all carried out um, very successfully. Uh, so that's uh, a bit of uh, our thoughts uh, that we are sharing uh, with all of you uh, on how um, LNG uh, can can be the uh, the fuel choice as as the sector decarbonizes uh, towards a net zero emission fuel. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much for 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 your speech. Um, here, which is a good complement to the the, uh, the the previous one, and and uh, yes, what what I get from uh, from what you said is that it's a kind of low hanging fruit this uh, LNG in the shipping sector in the sense that it's a good way, easy way of saving emissions, and it's true that nowadays one of the big challenges is to get uh, uh, emission savings from from uh, everywhere it it can come. I think that that's that's a big challenge. We we don't have a lot of time because uh, we will leave a few minutes for for closing the the session. So let's say that we have until it's uh, 25 past one for for a uh, few discussions, and we didn't have uh, so many questions. So so um, there, there is there there is one which is a, a little bit controversial that was uh, posted by by the. Uh, the, the uh, attendees, uh, which is that uh, big companies uh, do not really communicate about their research and development on pyrolysis. And the question was whether it was really successful or not. Have you got some elements uh, there? Another aspect uh, regards the development of LNG uh, transportation towards Ukraine. Um, well, under what conditions would it be possible to get further in the east? Uh, and I'd say if you could say all of you uh, in, in two or three words, what is the main big challenge you see in front of you? In particular, uh, to, to be a kind of message to be sent around to the uh, community of regulators that it's time to do so. So maybe on the first question, uh, Arno, do you, do you want to? Say a few words and maybe say well, your it's, own. Yeah, it's part of. I would say it's it, it's the nature of the study that we don't know if it's going if, if it's successful or not. I would argue it's not successful yet. Um, if there would be nowhere, they would be claiming for for funds for European funds and open up the projects to have more player joining them. Um, but they are working uh, on it on their own um, and. Um, well, the, the bets are open. I would say we will hear something within the next years on this technology. And when it comes to the overall challenge um, with regards to um, LNG decarbonizing in the short run, that it's, it's being used as it is now, uh, but even more broadly and transport and shipping, I would say that we really need to stick to technology neutrality in um, the policies from the European Commission. Uh, because too often, unfortunately, we see that options are being closed um, and that this uh, enormous potential that LNG has to reduce, to do something quickly and to reduce uh, both uh, greenhouse gases and pollutants. As of today, um, it is um, not being um, allowed uh, to act. So there are too many obstacles in that. And I posted one example here in the, in the, uh, in the comments debate, uh, so this is to me uh, still an issue. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Arno. Fabrizio, on this uh, enlargement of the network and the, the LNG uh, filling stations to the east, what comments from your side? Yeah, as I said, it is correct. I mean, uh, there's still a uh, while in the Western Europe there is a good uh, development of these infrastructures, there is still need to do uh, a lot of work toward the East and toward Russia. Um, focusing on Ukraine, and the fact is uh, that Ukraine as one of the biggest, as far as I know, pipelines for the gas transport um, around the territory. So it's very focused on that. 
But talking about road transport, what we see is that there are around 200 stations for CNG refilling, and we need to consider that uh, out of that 200 stations, uh, the CNG stations must be, uh, let's say, truck friendly. So it means that they need to have enough pressure and enough power to uh, refill a truck in a, a, a affordable time. So not all those 200 stations are ready to refill the trucks. Moreover, um, as far as I know, there are no LNG stations. So, so the fact is that we, we saw a big development of the um, uh, gas trucks um, pu pulled by the LNG development because uh, it allows uh, to do the long haul transport. Uh, we have a, a range of uh, uh, 1,600 kilometers of, with the with the LNG and uh, of about 600 kilometers with the CNG. So the fact of enabling a country in developing the uh, the gas uh, structure for the road transport is mainly, or in my opinion, linked to the availability of the bio LNG to um, switch from the local distribution and local transport to the long haul transport. Just to give an idea, 200 stations in Ukraine, uh, in Italy there are 1300 stations, CNG stations. So this is the numbers, so the, those are the numbers which we are playing country by country. Okay, thank you very much. So Sahira, uh, maybe uh, with a final word for, for you and the, within this session. Um, the question would be, yeah, the, the uh, regulation nowadays plays a key role because there are more there are more and more some obligations due to the uh, air cleaning if i may say uh, in 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 the ports and around the near near the the, the coasts um you you mentioned also the this question of uh, of price sensitivity so how do you see the future with a combination of these economic aspects and, and also this uh, pressure on the regulatory side. Um, I think, thank you for that, um, Bruno. I think, um, I mean, when we look currently, there is no uh, regulations is, um, with regards to uh, emissions by shipping, but this is going to change very soon. Uh, and Europe is taking um, the leadership on in this respect. Um, then I think uh, the earlier sessions we talked about who's going to pay for uh, this additional um, penalties that is imposed, uh, regardless of sectors uh, with regards to emissions, at the end of the day, end users have to pay. Uh, from a ship owner perspective, they are going to look at, okay, where I'm going to get money from the installation, I, uh, how I'm going to recover my investment from the installation that I've done. And our analysis shows that um, it works. Uh, we would love uh, for there to be regulation on CO2 emissions, for example, because we think LNG will be well suited in meeting those targets. Uh, so I'm quite positive in that respect. In fact, you know, we are talking to IMO uh, to try and make this happen. The, the irony is, and I think I saw a question on, on the screen by, uh, by one of the, uh, by the attendees, I think, is, uh, it is a bit lopsided when it comes to what uh, the regulators are prepared to do. Uh, it seems now there is this um, survey that is being done to talk about what is the fuel that can decarbonize or, or allow us to meet the 2030 targets. Uh, and a lot of the surveys, people don't talk about LNG. So something is clearly wrong. It's either we have not done our work properly or there is a bit of bias, uh, or what I call lopsided in terms of people's views, and it could probably be because they don't understand, um, but this definitely has to change, uh, because to just be thinking that we will have ammonia, uh, which is highly toxic, to just be thinking we can bring hydrogen, that's not gonna happen in 20, by 2030. Uh, it might happen on a pilot stage, um, but it would not be available in a commercially uh, and economically viable stage. So something needs to change here, um, in, in my view. Uh, and I'm not just think, saying about this because I work for Shell. I'm also saying this because I care about the environment. 
And sometimes we are just being uh, distracted um, by looking at other projects uh, instead of addressing and making changes right now. So that's my, my view. Thank you very much. No, it's, uh, it's very clear. And uh, that, that would welcome, let's say, having a global view of these energy issues and to avoid eliminating from the beginning some energy sources. So I think it's well noted. Uh, Rocio and Eve, uh, maybe we can uh, then give you tasks to conclude this uh, webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, to the second panel. It has been really useful, at least for me. <laughs> Many new things going on. Thank you very much to the panelists for you being one. Thank you, and thank you uh, to all the speakers for this live thank session. You. Yes, uh, as a way to conclude this uh, webinar, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, people we've not mentioned, uh, unfortunately, uh, Andra, uh, Katarina, thank you very much for your support in organizing uh, all the logistics and all the efforts you've put the last weeks or the last days for uh, having us together. Um, it has it has uh, been proven worth, uh, worthy uh, of your efforts. Uh, once again, thank you very much. Um, with regard to, as a matter of wrap up, um, what uh, we can deduct, uh, what we can uh, take us, uh, take with us uh, while going home from uh, the intervention of uh, Professor Stern and um, the various questions is that yes, there will be LNG in Europe at least until 2030 which is a good news. Um, it will, of course, uh, also depend on the development on the, on the demand in Asia and the willingness to store gas in Europe. And yes, um, in the framework of, in the light of the decarbonization of the path towards decarbonization regulation, which probably uh, needed to be adapted. Um, yes, Rocio? Yes. Okay. Uh, um, and um, that with regard to the the first panel, but uh, prior to to uh, uh, giving also the okay. word the floor. Uh, uh, yes, regarding the second regarding the second panel, uh, we have put together the European Commission, the regulators, and a trading company, and. The, the, the thing is, the conclusion is that many things are going on in Europe regarding LNG. For many years, after many years of not talking about LNG, we are talking again about LNG because we are having much more. And since we're having much more LNG and more uses for the LNG, we're having much more services. Uh, the trading company, uh, probably, uh, they make a summary of how different sometimes LNG terminals are, but well, I haven't seen this as a, as a, a wrong thing, that is something that happens and eventually accomplish what market needs. And then European Commission was looking at the LNG sector, looking how to improve. And of course, the, a consultant has reached the conclusions that there are many things that could be improvement. Now, the discussion or what the European Commission is going to be doing is analyze what the consultant said. And together, I guess, with the rest of the stakeholders, uh, we're going to see what is the what what is now the, the the consequences of this study. Particularly, the European uh, the regulators, we are not really keen to 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 go for strong regulation on any new thing. We are we really particularly uh, support a more uh, work flexibility, service development, uh, more transparency. And uh, I think the, the, we are seeing new developments all over Europe, different countries with different approaches. And the, the audience was really uh, on the mood of asking what's going on. Are regulators, are the European Commission going to impose any, any new change? Uh, how we are going to cope with decarbonization? What is going to happen with the bio, bio LNG? I think this is the type of issues that probably will be discussed in the next Madrid Forum and in the next month uh, together. I think we can now move on the third panel. Um, uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So regarding the, the third panel, uh, what is clear is that LNG uh, could enable energy sector integration, uh, a smart and sustainable mobility, 
Um, LNG is currently supporting a multi-modal transport system based on efficient and sustainable com uh, combination between uh, waterborne, roll and railway. Uh, security supply with distributed storage and refueling infrastructures is ready for, for uh, growing, uh, for, for supporting renewable uh, gases. Uh, um, gas, I mean, a biogas could replace more polluted fuels. Uh, LNG could improve air quality and limit emissions of CO2. Um, the TSOs, oh, sorry, the LSOs has been working to, uh, together in order to analyze what is the role of the LNG terminals, uh, depending on which, which is the solution that we will end up having. So greener gas, the carbonization uh, in, after the LNG terminal, or if we're going to move directly into other uh, e-fuels like methanol or ammonia, or the liquid A. a Hydrogen. I think the, the, the conclusion here is that this is a long-term vision, the e-fuels and the hydrogen particularly. Uh, they need significant investments, they are not going to be ready until 2035. And so I, I'm for sure if this happens and we are using the same infrastructure as gas, we are going to be needing much more uh, regulation. So let's focus on gas. Uh, so the conclusion of the third panel, I will say, is that uh, gas can contribute now and is contributing already now. I, we have seen it in, in the effect of presentation. So the increasing number of heavy duty trucks, increasing number of stations, how the economics are working both for, for vehicles and for maritime transport. And particularly uh, this worriness about why maritime transport, we are not I mean, coming from the audience also, why we are not better placed uh, as the LNG as a fuel for the future to invest already um, on new uh, on new uh, ships uh, with LNG. I don't know if, if you want to add something. No, that's okay. Um, maybe with regard to um, there's one element that has been slightly touched upon um, is the price com competitiveness uh, being uh, with regard to the CNG or LNG uh, trucks, but also with regard to um, the um, energy as a uh, bunker fuel for, for the ships, because at the end, the end user will pay for it, as uh, Shaira rightly put. Um, I would like to um, thank all the panelists for their contribution today. It's been very useful. Uh, thanks for your efforts. Thanks, thanks for your clarity in your explanations. And also, I would like to thank all the attendees for their questions. Uh, if there are questions we have, which have not been um, answered by the panel during the, the two panels during the discussions, uh, we will probably take them uh, with us um, in the debriefing. Thank you. Thank you again uh, to everybody. Yeah, thank you. And I just want to remind you that the recordings and the presentations will be available on CEO web page as soon as possible. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye bye to everyone. <clears throat>